This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Boz Digital Labs, and Jay-Z Microphones. So get ready to rock. I've been writing songs since I was like nine. I've got thousands of songs that I'll just write in the shower. So once I learned how to use a DAW, and once I learned how to play piano and, and sing just a little bit, all of those songs in my head now had a medium to come out. Those people, you just really do have to give them those tools and those techniques, and then they're fine. Other people love music, but they don't have like the finished picture in their head, and you kind of have to show them how to start picturing that end picture. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and used Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac, the speed to create, the capacity to dream. Now find out how awesome your studio can be at OWC. This episode is sponsored by Boz Digital Labs, offering you the coolest plugins for your mixes, like the Hoser XT and Plus 10 dB Signature Series. You can transform your drums with Sasquatch Kick Machine or Transgressor, get massive bass with Big Clipper, or add width and depth using Mongoose and Imperial Delay. All Boz Digital Labs plugins are available as fully functioning, no time limit free trials, so you can check them out on your mixes right now. Just go to bozdigitallabs.com or click the link in the show notes of this episode. This episode is sponsored by Jay-Z Microphones with the unique Golden Drop capsule design. The Black Hole Series BH-1S and BH-2 microphones with the hole in the middle for a -a one-of-a-kind shock mount combine innovative industrial design with careful craftsmanship to bring a world-class sound to your studio, resulting in a level of quality and detail in your recordings that you won't find in other mics. Go to jzmic.com or click the link in the show notes below and use the limited time coupon ROCKSTAR right now to get an incredible 50% off. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Austin Hall, a producer, writer, and mixing engineer living in Orlando, Florida. Austin is also the founder of Make Pop Music, featuring a thriving Facebook group dedicated to producers, writers, engineers, and artists interested in making a living in pop music, or who just like to chat about underground pop. Austin also hosts a YouTube channel, publishing videos twice a week on production tips, business advice, and featured guests. And on the Make Pop Music website, you can find blog posts, sample packs, various preset downloads, and music production courses. Austin's client list includes hundreds of independent artists, including Coda Millo, Sry, Emia, Troy Ogletree, Liam Ferrari, Stella Jones, and Forget Tomorrow, to just name a few of them. And I'm super psyched today to find out more from Austin about pop music and how we can produce better pop music from our pro and home studios, whether it's for ourselves or for our clients. So please welcome Austin Hall to Recording Studio Rockstars. Austin, are you ready to rock, dude? I am so ready to rock. Dude, it's great to have you here, man. Um, You know, I I remember that, uh, so Daniel Grimmett is a mutual friend, and he's also been on the podcast and somebody that you have worked with a bunch. And I remember the first time I saw what you guys were up to with Make Pop Music and this, you know, like thriving Facebook group, I was just so impressed. You just have so much going on over there. Yeah, thank you so much. Also, first of all, um, you know, thank you so much for having me on it. I was very familiar when Dan did the podcast. So when you reached out to have me on, I was like, absolutely, absolutely, I have to do it. So um, super, super appreciate you having me on. But yeah, it's been insane. The uh, the group has been a real game changer for for me. It's 
it was all kind of accidental, which I'm sure we'll kind of explore a little bit throughout the podcast and the interview, but it's been insane. And, and honestly, it's taught me so many things kind of along the way before I started the group, I was really just kind of like a hobbyist who didn't even really see music as a career. It was just something that I really enjoyed doing. And the community aspect was something I was missing in pop. So creating that community, um, kind of accidentally turned into clients and accidentally turned into kind of, to, into kind of an authoritative state for me with pop music, because at the time I was just kind of a kid who, um, you know, enjoyed making pop music, but I, I wasn't really an expert in it. I wasn't really experienced. I was just still working with like a local artist and myself to develop a portfolio. So that group and the YouTube channel and all of the support that we've gotten has been an insane game changer. And, um, that's really, really in part to people like you and like six figure home studio and some of the other people who reach out to let me tell my story and to kind of expand, you know, our community and our network, because it's all still pretty new and pretty fresh, but it, it wouldn't be possible without everybody being so nice and supportive and helpful. Well, you're welcome, man. And we're glad to have you here. Um, one of the cool things I like here, but hearing about your story is how you really just, you, you got into music and producing and everything. And I, uh, and you'll tell us more about it. But essentially, my understanding is that, you know, creating this Facebook group and getting into the YouTube videos, it was really just uh, sort of a fun extension of what you were already doing. And then it became this, you know, this this calling for you. But tell us, you know, more about who you are and about how you, how you got into music and everything. And then tell us, you know, about the beginning of Make Pop Music. Yeah, 100%. So my name's Austin, kind of as Lich touched on. I am currently 24 years old and I live in Orlando, Florida. I am a full-time producer, mixing engineer and songwriter, like by trade. That's, you know, typically what I've done for the past couple of years to pay the bills um, and just to support my family. And kind of on the side, I've had the Make Pop Music Group, which we'll kind of dive into, but just a, a brief one rundown of how I even got into production. Um, I was basically like an 18-year-old kid who was in a band and we were recording a lot of demos we were like a metal band and it was just getting really, really expensive to keep going to studios and paying for demos that we weren't even releasing. They were just for us to take to different studios to record finals. And so finally I was like, you know what, man, screw this. Like, I'm just going to download a computer. They don't have to be good. They're just demos. I was able to, you know, play piano, play guitar, sing. Um, and then once I learned like what, you know, MIDI was with drums and with all the different, you know, MIDI elements that you can throw in, I just really got addicted because I had my band that I was so used to writing with. But then once I started kind of learning the basics for the band to record demos, I kind of got obsessed with the fact that I could sit down, have a whole song in my head and lay it down by myself. Like I didn't have to get six people in one room. I didn't have to pay somebody a thousand dollars to record my idea. It was able, it was just kind of an outlet for me to sit down and play a chord on the piano and then line in a guitar and lay down something and then me sing over it. And mm. I just really like fell in love with the creative process of that because I grew up really, really liking rock music and pop music and stuff that was a lot more full band. I never really wanted to do like the singer songwriter thing. So while I, you know, have been writing songs on acoustic guitar since I was nine years old, it just, <laughs> it gets a little old at times. And like, it's, it's very one dimensional. Like I couldn't really find a way to break past that without relying on other people. And when you, you know, you're a kid and I was working full time, I had a really, really serious girlfriend. I was in school and then I had the band kind of all of those obligations, it was really hard to like meet up with people to do things that I wanted to do on the side. So that's really just how I fell in love with recording and producing. And I made rock music for a couple of years. Then I just started getting a little burnt out and I decided that I wanted to do something more uh, kind of like pop electronic related. So I started just kind of dabbling in that production and uh, just coming from pop or coming from metal, there were so many online communities that that were, you know, just forums for kids to pop on and they could talk to some of the biggest guys in the industry in that section. Like I was in, you know, Cam's uh, Chango Studios group in like 2011, 2012. And then I was in Joey Sturgis's group and there were all of the metal groups. And I really love that community aspect because that's where I would go to ask people, you know, how do you get that guitar tone? How do you do that with drums? How do you, um, you know, make your vocal not sound like it was recorded on a toaster? And they were, su <laughs> they were super, super helpful because the YouTube videos are great. And of course I've watched thousands of hours of those, but it's hard for a YouTube video to answer your exact question unless that content was based on your question. Right. So having that community was really nice. And then when I left metal, I kind of missed it. Like I was like, there's, there's really nobody to talk to, like nobody to get ears on for a pop track. There's nobody to meet. There's kind of no mentors. You're no not in idols. a band. You're not exactly. doing pop music, right? Exactly. So I didn't even have a, I didn't even have bandmates. So I didn't have bandmates. I didn't have 
the, you know, the Chango group, the Joey's group and none of that stuff. So I was like, you know what? Like, I'm sure I can't be the only kid that's interested in pop music. So I just made the group one night just because I was like, I need somebody to share some demos with. So I invited like a hundred friends. They invited friends, they invited friends, they invited friends. And then just over the past couple of years, it's been really passive. Like I haven't forced anything. We've never like spent money on advertising. It's been really simple and organic, but we've just grown to like, we've got 20,000 members on the Facebook group. Now we've got 30,000 subscribers on YouTube. And I think that it's because it all started as a genuine community. It was never a way for me to like promote myself. It was never a way for me to kind of like funnel clients. And it wasn't really a sales tactic. Like I see so many people trying to like bottle up. They're trying to put lightning in a bottle and be like, well, if I can have this YouTube video, I'll be successful. If I can have this Facebook group, I'll have clients lined up. And like, if you're going into it with those things in mind, I I don't think it's ever going to work. I think that they're really nice to supplement you once you kind of have your boundaries. But in terms of like getting that organic start, um, I think it all comes back to just being genuine and just building a community. It's the same as like, you know, 20 years ago, if you wanted to, to meet artists to record, you would go hang out at the bar and watch somebody perform this set right, and you go right. talk to them afterwards. Yeah, yeah. And we've kind of fallen out of that just a little bit. And the online community kind of gives us an opportunity to make those same style relationships to where they're mostly professional relationships, but you still get a lot of that like companionship and just that genuine friendship. So most of the people in the group, even most of my clients, I just talk to almost every day, very casually. I'm super casual with everything. Nothing is like that strategic. Nothing is forced. And and that's really what make pop music has been about. And that's just kind of what my my whole brand as a producer has been about is like, I want to work with independent people by choice. I want to work with artists that are hungry for success. I want to work with people that don't feel like you need to have like a hundred thousand dollar marketing budget, uh, that you have to pay back. Like I want to work with these people that are genuinely motivated and that genuinely want to form, you know, teams and companionship and friendships and, you know, meet mentors and stuff like that. So that's, that's really what it's been all about. And now we're honestly just to this point, it's kind of just all snowballed, you know, it's, it's, since it's been so organic, it's hard to really describe how it's happened. I think just by having the group start from a really, really genuine place and start with genuine people, it's just grown from that. So we don't have a lot of spam. We don't have a lot of disrespect in there. We don't have a lot of people trying to, you know, talk down to people or try to run the group. It's just, it's super, super chill. It's almost like a coffee shop online. Right, right. Well, actually, you know, I want to, I would love to get more thoughts from you about you know, ways that we can even improve our own Facebook group for recording studio rock stars, because I've admired how yours has been so thriving and these things that you describe about having lots of natural, um, you know, activity going there and and the kind of stuff that really generates a great conversation. And maybe we can get some tips on stuff that you've seen in a Facebook group where, you know, it, it tends to derail it or it tends to, you know, be interpreted as spam versus things that really seem to engage people. But what, just generally speaking, what sort of advice would you have for Recording Studio Rockstar's Facebook group? So I think with any Facebook group, and I've kind of learned this over the past several years, it's like when I started, I wanted it to be super casual, but not overly casual. So like I didn't want it to feel like one group that I think is really professional to the point to where you can't really get away with a lot is the Slate group, right? Which is killer because it's it's his group it's for their products Mm -hmm. so they don't want any bs in there which i totally understand and they run a really really yes yes steven slate steven slate group and they run a really really type ship and i respect that and they can do that because people are there for their products and you know to talk to steven and to talk to some of the admins so they're able to get away with it being super tight super professional. Like it's almost like an extension of like a support group or something like that. Then on the other hand, you have groups where everybody's just joking around all the time. It's literally nothing but memes. Nothing important is ever happening there. It's just people there to, to screw around. And I think that the balance is kind of in the middle of that, especially like for me, you know, I started the group to not be about me. It was just about pop music. So I think having kind of that general audience to where they're there to talk about something besides one person or one product or one show or something like that, that helps to expand that audience. And it helps to just expand the topics that people feel comfortable talking about. And so one of the things that we have to kind of noticed with the group is, you know, we've got our rules that we stick to. Um, I don't mind people promoting themselves if they're doing so in a way to where it offers something of value to people that are looking at it. So like if you're promoting yourself that only offers value to yourself and you're just posting your link and you're like, check out my song, mm-hmm. um, that's yeah, we, we definitely post. have that sort of thing. We we yeah. we get that. I mean, I I even find myself wanting to do the same thing, 
But at the same time, it's like, I want to make sure that there's a good reason for somebody to want to actually engage with that, that post in Facebook, you know? 100%. And there's a really, really good happy medium where I think that you can post about things that you're working on um, and just sprinkle in some tips, just sprinkle in maybe a little bit of like behind the scenes information, you know, like, hey, check out this song. When we recorded vocals, we actually set up three mics and we set up three different mics to have three different, you know, styles and we blended those together. And here's kind of the result of that. Just as an example of like, yeah. give people some behind the scenes of the process where you still allow people to promote and, you know, talk about themselves. People love talking about themselves. That leads to engagement. But at the same time, other people can learn something and can get something from that. And then you just mix that with like allowing people to have, you know, an occasional laugh, allowing an occasional meme, allowing people to get a little rowdy sometimes. Like I think of it like you want it to be kind of like a party to where like it's really lively, but you don't want people in there like breaking your expensive vases, right? You've got people having a good time, but they're not ruining things. They're not disrespecting things. And I think that that's really, really important. So I would say like just try to have that really, really inviting kind of fun vibe to where it's professional, but it's not overly serious. And mm -hmm. then while we were growing the group, what one thing that like really, really stood out as a big growth point for us was when we started having like daily content from admins. So, you know, Monday would be like mod Monday where we'd have one moderator that week share something that they, you know, share like a tip or trick or something or, or something they were working on. Then on Tuesday we would have, um, like tutorial Tuesday where we would drop a video. Then on Wednesday we would have like, what's up Wednesday where people in the group could talk about what they were up to. And then Thursday we would have something else and Friday. So like we have these kind of flagship threads daily from the mods. So like, at least if the group is not popping and people aren't posting on their own, we're kind of commanding people to come start conversations. And then a lot of those times, those will lead to threads outside of that one thread. Right, so I yeah. think having, having the mod driven conversation is really, really good to just kind of boost the morale and show people like, Hey, it's okay to chat in here. Like you don't have to be worried about like anything you post getting deleted. Um, you know, we can have a good time. Like the other day, in the group, I was just like, it was like kind of overly serious in there. And there had been like some bickering about just stupid stuff. Just like everybody was talking about the Billie Eilish, uh, like album that came out. Some people were over it and some people wanted to talk about it more. And and finally I was just like, too many people are talking about this. And, and like, I just needed to change the subject. Mm -hmm. So I literally just posted on there. I was like, if this gets 20,000 likes, I'll get hell yeet tatted on me. And that, like, since I posted that, the group has been a whole different vibe and like just a stupid, really, really, really dumb shit posts like that has turned into something to where like now we've kind of shifted focus. And I think just having that kind of like conversational mood in the community is, is really, really key. Did you get 20,000 likes on that post? Did you have to get a tattoo? No, I didn't get 20. We No, it ended up getting like five or 600 though, which was scary. Like I was like, where are you guys when we're like showing you that we have a new product? <laughs> That's funny, man. Um, okay. So uh, let me let me let me dig in a little deeper because I really do want the Recording Studio Rockstars Facebook group to be the very best it can. And Rockstars, yeah. if you're um, not already in our group, um, you know Facebook groups are just sort of a great place to have a conversation, be able to you know share stuff and get questions and answers. Um, so just go to rsrockstars.com/fb and that'll take you to the Facebook group. Then then just answer a few questions and then um, I then we you know, let you into the group and then you can start interacting with everybody. So when somebody um, wants to share their music, you suggesting, you know, go ahead and share something, but maybe talk about some thing that's in there that, um, you know, that, that you learned or some cool technique you did that makes it interesting for somebody else to want to go check it out and press play on the music and check it out. What about when people are like, Hey, can I get some feedback on what do you think about my mix? Do you find that that's that's a useful thing, or is that too, 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 you know, doing your own P, too much doing your own PR, or is it too vague of a question? So I think that that's a really good question. If the song is not out, I do have a problem with people posting their Spotify link and saying, "Hey, give me tips on this mix." Um, the mix is already mm. done at that point. You're not mm. going to go revise it. Um, if you if you want criticism for future stuff. Be like, Hey, I just released a song. I mixed it myself. Um, you know, I did this, this, and this, and this, what are some things that you think could use work for the next release? What are some things that you think are strong that I could definitely like dive more into just kind of elaborate on what kind of feedback you want. Cause when you just want crits, um, a lot of the time, a, the people that shouldn't be critiquing your stuff show up first to critique it and b 
um, people don't know what to say. They're like, is this guy really going to take this feedback? Well, do I need to just kind of like be gentle with them? Do I need to just kind of fluff them up? Um, so, so <laughs> if, if you have something like that, be genuinely ready to get some harsh criticism because that's yeah. kind of like the point of those posts. And I think that's really useful, you know, when you're sharing a Dropbox link or a Google drive link or something like that and saying like, Hey, um, if you're wanting criticism, I think that you should say kind of what you want criticism on. So like I did this the other day, I was like working on a song and I was like, Hey, um, at, at this point, like this, this drum pattern feels a little funky, but I can't quite put my finger on what it is that's throwing it off. And then you post it and then people know, Hey, let me listen to the drums and figure out what might be throwing them off. So like, Oh, you know, the, the hi hats are too busy or, Oh, the toms, you know, the, just the sound selection doesn't work when you draw the focus into one specific thing like that. And for anybody listening, this is also how you become a better member in these communities. And this is how you start to like get more, um, like for, for lack of a better word, like clout and attention in those communities is knowing how to actually like communicate and speak with people mm -hmm. and, the better that you can make your post, the better interaction you'll get. That's more people that see your name. That's more people that when they want to check out an artist might come to you or when they need to hire a producer might come to you. So the key to all of this is like just having a group is not going to be enough. You have to be in front of people at all times. And that comes along with posting things that start good conversation. And then when other people post things that start good conversation, commenting on that and contributing. And it's really like you kind of get what you give. So well, you know, I've, I, I, I've also found that? that questions are really, really effective. So when somebody mm -hmm. just posts on there and just says, "Hey, I'm I'm looking for you know a good way to stereo mic the drums as, with my overheads," you know, what do you guys think? I'm in a small space. That usually gets a great conversation going. One hundred percent. Yeah, and I mean that's that's what people feel like they're there for, right? Like it's it's kind of like a like a seminar. Like that's why we're all there. You know, it all kind of started with like forums on like gear slots and other websites years ago, where if people had an issue, that's where they would go. So that's still like the primary reason that people are using that. So you can, you can ask questions and promote yourself at the same time. Technically, anytime you're posting in there, you're promoting yourself because people are seeing your name and the better that you can articulate your questions and make it sound like, Hey, I know what I'm doing other than in this one scenario for one, you're going to get better feedback because people are going to treat your question with respect because they're like, okay, they're ready to hear my feedback. And then for two, it just, like I said before, it puts your, your name and it puts your face in front of people. So if people need, you know, somebody to mic a drum kit, they'll be like, well, I know that that guy knows how to mic a drum kit. Like he just asked a question on it and uh, he just did it. So I think it's, it's really about like asking questions, but knowing how to word those questions to invite conversation. Yeah. I think a lot of the folks in the recording studio Rockstars Facebook group are really looking to sort of interact and, and, um, you know, as far as promotion and self-promotion goes, I, I, you know, sometimes I think people are trying to promote in terms of like, I'm really trying to grow my audience as an artist, but mostly I think most of us are what you described earlier, where it's like, you know, I'm in this sort of lonely studio environment working on my music. I'm having a blast. It's super fun, but who do I share it with and get a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, validification for having done something cool. And that's what's great about uh, being able to share your work in there is that you can just kind of share it with everybody and get get a little bit of feedback and, you know, even getting people saying, you know, like, hey, man, that sounds great. Nice work, you know, because most of us doubt ourselves while we're doing this work anyway. And it's nice to get some um, verification that what you're doing is actually a whole lot better than you think or the or vice versa, you know, that, you know, you didn't even realize that that reverb that you put on everything is kind of destroying your mix. And if it was a little bit drier, it would sound better. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can go to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level. And you can start right now with my free introduction to mixing course, Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio with free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you are in Logic, Cubase, Presona Studio One, Reaper, or anything you can think of. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to Mix masterbundle.com to get started for free now or look for the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. Tell us tell us more about pop music. So, you know, I know make pop music is the theme. Um, you know, you're you're a younger generation than me and it's it's fun for me to hear you drop terms like crits and things like that. You know, there's just all this language that is um 
the most normal thing in the world to you that's that's brand new to me and, and brand new maybe to many of our listeners as well. Um, but what, you know, when I grew up, I think of pop music, I'm thinking top 40, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, I don't know. I, I can't even conjure up a, an example right now, but it's what I grew up with as pop music is probably very different from what you're thinking of as pop music now, or maybe it's not. So what is pop music? That's a super good question. And it's, it's honestly a really, really hard question to answer because typically when people are talking about it, even, you know, back in the eighties, pop music was Madonna. It was Prince. It was Michael Jackson. It was Duran Duran. It was all of those people that were nailing the top forties. And I think that that's still, uh, those are my examples I was music. looking for. You're absolutely yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. And I think that, that when people think of pop music, they do kind of anticipate that top forties popular music. So make pop music has been really careful to, to when we're talking about pop music, there's, there's kind of two ways that you can use that. So you can talk about pop music in terms of pop 40, which in case Drake is a pop artist, Cardi B is a pop artist. Mm -hmm. Um, Post Malone is a pop artist. All, and, all music that my 13 year old daughter listens to and digs. But it's funny because like realistically speaking in terms of genres, those are all hip hop artists, right? Yep. Chris Stapleton, top 40, he's now a pop artist, but he's a country artist. It's so you have that, um, idea of like, well, if, if it's on the charts, it's, it's pop music, right? Those are the pop charts. Um, but we also have pop in terms of like the more traditional kind of genre approach where I think the genre would be more like your Taylor Swift's, your Ariana Grande's, your Jonas Brothers, where it's very uplifting. It's very bubbly. It's fun, fast paced, lots of electronic elements. You still got some organic elements, um, really grandiose productions. That's what a lot of people think of as pop music. So kind of similar to how Madonna was at in the, you know, in the eighties, yeah. how Lady Gaga was at in the late two thousands. And then kind of how we have Taylor Swift as that now. So you've got pop music on both forms and we try to do our best to kind of dive into both of those. Because I feel like if you're getting into music, um, you know, the more, the more genres that you can work in and that you can get comfortable with, I think the better chance you have of a finding what you're best at and b paying your bills, because there's only a certain amount of singer songwriter artist out there. And there's a certain amount of producers that are going to produce that genre. So if you can do that genre, great, you can dip into that market. But if you can also produce something like a Drake beat, or if you can also produce something that sounds like the weekend, perfect. Now you have two more markets. So that's what we're trying to do with make pop is we're trying to get people to kind of expand. And we, we tend to divide pop into a couple different sections, um, just for our own audience. So we've got like acoustic pop, which is like your Ed Sheeran, Adele, Sam Smith, like singer songwriter type pop. Yeah. Then you've got your indie pop, which is going to be like your Lauves, your Julia Michaels, like the artists that you see really up and coming on Spotify. I like to call it Spotify pop just because that's like their typical market. They do that. They crush it. They make, you know, six, seven figures a year making music without ever getting on the radio. Hmm. And so that's kind like of the Spotify, indie pop market. Is, Spotify is like the new um, college radio market. 100%. So we see a huge market with that. Um, so you've got acoustic pop, indie pop, and then there's like electronic pop where you have people like chain smokers, like flume, like marshmallow to where, um, to a lot of like electronic music purists, it's probably really watered down. And to a lot of people who are just average listeners, they love it. It's got a really, really fun beat. It's really easy to follow. Um, it's typically got a really, really nice feature for a top line. So there's your electronic pop. Then you've got your funk pop or kind of like your, your synth pop where you've got like your Bruno Mars kind of vintage inspired pop. You've got like the 1975. You've got people dipping into these more retro sounds where they're not afraid to bring out, you know, a, a Moog synth or they're not afraid to gate the reverb on the drums. Um, and we're seeing that a lot now, especially with, like I said, Bruno Mars, the 1975, Laney, all those type of people. And then you've got like your dark pop, which is like your Halsey's, your... Um, I like to lump a lot of the hip hop artists in here. So like the weekend, even Drake, it's, it's going to be a lot darker melodies. It's a how lot. About, how about Lord? Would you, would you think of Lord, Lord as dark, dark pop? pop? Yeah. She'd be, she'd be a mix between dark pop and indie pop. Yeah. Um, so what do you find as unifying factors between all these genres of pop? What, now that you've seen, you know, different styles, but you, but they're all sort of coalesced into something called pop. What do you think are the things that sort of tie them all together as making them part of the same genre? Or not, yeah. not same genre, but same like, you know, larger category. category. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So like I said before, um, top 40s is a really good indication. And then for people that are not quite at that level, which is 99.9% of everybody else, um, the thing that makes a song pop versus something else that might be in that other genre to me is melody. So the reason that The Weeknd has transitioned into a pop artist now versus when his first album, uh, you know, House of Balloons or even when Trilogy came out is melody and just kind of song composition. So at first it was a lot more experimental. Um, he was, he was like an R and B artist. So melodies were a lot more fluid. They didn't have a lot of repetition. They were kind of all over the place and they sounded really traditional kind of R and B alternative. And now he's kind of transitioned that into, you know, a little bit cleaner production, um, more simple song structures to where everything's, you know, a verse, a chorus, a pre-chorus. He's got that really, really nice hook that's going to pull you in. And to me, that's what has made him through really through like beauty behind the madness, Starboy, and, um, his last EP that he just dropped. Now he's a pop artist and not just an R and B artist. And we've seen that with Drake as well. Like in take care, he was definitely just an R and B hip hop artist. Now, um, you know, he's got radio smashes that everybody's grandmother singing. He's now a pop artist. And then we see it too with, um, even people like Ed Sheeran. So like at first he was like singer songwriter, very, very, very low key. Then he had, you know, a team come and that had a lot catchier melody than everything he had before. Then he had don't, then he had, uh, you know, um, what's the other thinking out loud. So he had all of these kind of progressions in terms of melody and structure. And you kind of start to associate all of these really, really, really catchy songs with being pop. So I think the the main thing that makes pop pop is, is 100% the melody. And then too, just mm-hmm. kind of like how you market that and present that. So it's a lot cleaner around the edges. Um, you know, maybe besides some of the smaller like indie pop stuff. I think that, that that's one of the biggest things about pop is like it can be anything, but to be pop, you really have to fit into that. Like, could I put this top line over like a Britney Spears instrumental and it still makes sense? If so, yeah, it's pop. If not, probably not. All right, cool. Well, you're starting to drop some more terminology that I want to ask you about. But before we do, I'd like to also ask our guests to share an inspirational quote as we kick off the show. And I wondered if there was anything you wanted to kind of share with us to get us excited about hitting the studio. Yeah, 100%. So um, one quote that has kind of just always stuck with me, um, because I get questions a lot about like, are you ever worried about giving away your secrets about the group? Or are you scared about giving away your production techniques on the YouTube group? And um, I've seen it since I started producing because I started in all these groups. And, And honestly, I think that if you're only as good as your secrets, then you're not good enough. Because yeah. I should be able to make a YouTube video where I show somebody exactly how I mix a vocal. And I guarantee you, they're probably not going to come out sounding the same. And they might, theirs might sound better. Theirs might sound worse, but there's different things in taste and just personal techniques that somebody will never, ever, ever be able to teach. Like I'll never be able to tell somebody how a song forms in my head because it just kind of happens at a, like at a split second. So I can't teach that. There are a lot of things that I can teach. There are a lot of secrets and tips and cheats and tricks that I can give away. Um, but like I'm, I'm still better than those. Yeah. I'm still better than all of those tips and tricks. And for people that are ever scared about like, Oh, well, if I tell, you know, everybody how I get my secret sauce on my vocals, everybody's going to sound like me. If everybody's going to sound like you by that one thing, then you're not good enough. Right. That's sort of like saying, if I teach somebody the English language and, you know, 12 steps in a major, in a you know musical scale, everybody's going to be able to write songs and sing like me. Exactly. There's going to be tools and there's going to be tricks and there's even going to be like cheat codes that get you, you know, quite a long way. But at the end of the day, it's really all how you can um, kind of just interpret all of those things and use them to your own advantage. So that's one of the things we like talk about most on our YouTube videos. Like, don't just blindly follow what I say. That's why I don't ever just give out like my settings or I don't just like post pictures of my vocal changes because like that's way, way, way too subjective. I'd rather show people like, Hey, when you're compressing a vocal, these are things to watch out for. So like, this is the reason that I had the attack at this, then, you know, the release at this and, you know, the gain reduction at this. And so when you can explain the methods to all of those things, then people can actually use them. If I tell somebody, Hey, you know, drag this knob here, this knob here, and this knob here. And then it sounds like crap in their own mix. They're going to come to me complaining later. Yeah. Well, I mean, a couple of thoughts about that. One is sometimes it's just fun to sort of peek into the world of what people used on things. And, you mm-hmm. know, for the for the entertainment and the, or the, the pleasure of hearing the story about it, that's cool. But I'm with you that, you know, even if we use the exact same gear, we're going to get different results. Um, 
Sometimes when you don't have anything and you're really just not sure where to start, it can be encouraging to have somebody come along and just say, hey, you know what? Start with these few things. You'll do great. But again, it doesn't mean you're going to produce the same results. Um, let me ask you this. So, you know, in the Facebook group, you know, you have a lot of people asking questions and stuff. And I figure at this point, you must have seen some pretty common questions that people tend to ask. Um, maybe for people who are beginning, what are some of the first questions that people t tend to come to you with about how to make great pop music? So we kind of have two schools on this. We get production questions and we get a lot of business questions. Um, so like just some of the most basic production questions we get are number one, just gear suggestions. You know, what mic should I get? What interface should I get? What monitor should I get? Um, and we have a lot of members. So, so people always show up on that and recommend stuff. And it's super cool to see what everybody recommends. And then for two, um, we get like the really, really, really basic stuff. Like how do you come up with a chord progression or how do you come up with a lead vocal melody? It's all of these things that are very fundamental. And honestly, they're kind of a lot of trial and error in my opinion. Like I can show you how I write a chord progression or you can learn theory, but like at the end of the day, that's all your taste. So like it's a lot easier to teach production techniques, like how to do a vocal chop or how to do a delay throw than it is to show somebody here's how you write a song because right. – there's no actual formula to that. So that's, we get that question so much. Um, and it always comes back to the same thing. It's like, there are some tools and there are some tricks that you can use, but at the end of the day, like you just have to spend years writing like tons and tons of shitty songs. Yeah. And then maybe you'll get a couple of good ones and that's just how it goes. Well, uh, um, let me, let me comment on that. So I actually just came from a songwriting clinic in Boston this past weekend, which was so much fun to go do. And it was with a great songwriting teacher named Pat Patterson, who's been doing this for years and years. But again, like in teaching it, he really just focused on some of the tools, like here's what you could do with the rhyme scheme. Here's, you know, what you can do with the melody, stuff like that. It's the tools um, as opposed to like, here's how you just make a, go make a great song. Uh, but then when I was talking with another friend of mine, Steve O'Brien, who will be on the podcast soon to talk about songwriting, he pointed out that one of the tr challenges of trying to teach somebody how to write a great song is that when a great song comes along, it always sounds unique and different. And that's what mm -hmm. makes it so special to you. So how do you t teach people how to make something that hasn't existed yet? Which I thought 100%. was an interesting insight. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's hard to really innovate everything. And even in the songs that feel 100% new and organic, they're probably borrowing a chord from something or a melody from something. So like, we're going to repeat stuff in music. There's a very finite number of, you know, melodies and chord progressions that you can do. But I think that's why it's just so crucial to kind of develop all those tools and techniques. And, you know, some people just have a bit more natural ability where they'll they'll literally just hear a song in their head and all they need is the tools to figure out how to take that song from their head to their actual DAW. Mm. Like that was that was kind of me. I've been writing songs since I was like nine and I've got, you know, thousands of songs that I'll just write in the shower. So once I learned how to use, you know, a DAW and once I learned how to play piano and, and sing just a little bit, um, all of those songs in my head now had a medium to come out. So some people, like those people, you just really do have to give them those tools and those techniques, and then they're fine. Other people love music, but they don't have like the finished picture in their head, and you kind of have to show them how to start picturing that end picture. And that's one thing that I don't know um, – if I'm quite ready to, to like teach or educate people on, because I feel like that is just so subjective and personal to everybody's way of thinking or their learning style. Like I went to school for education. So if it sounds like I'm like talking about a lot of this, like your high school teacher would, it's because that's what I went to school for. <laughs> and so I, I've nice. seen it with mass. I've seen it with English. I've seen it with science and some people just get it. And some people just don't. And like music is not going to be for everybody. And as much as it sucks to say that some of the people in our group just will never, ever make it in music. I mean, it is just life, but you have to do everything in your power to help them that way when they're, you know, when they're finally understanding that it's not for them, that's on their terms. That's not from you drilling it into their head that they'll never be something because they might surprise you. Um, you know, I've had tons of people that I, I thought like, eh, yeah, like we'll, we'll see. And then like a year later, I hear something from them. And I'm like, holy crap. Like that was incredible. Nice. And I've had other people that I think like will be able to wow me. And then it's just nothing ever really happens. So I think that, that all of that fundamental kind of building a song and touching on emotion and stuff like that, you really can't teach that. People just have to learn that from trial and error on their own. Yeah. And, and let's not forget too that not everything in music needs to be goal oriented. You know, like you don't have to quote win 
at this. You know, there's it's perfectly fine to be just enjoying the whole journey and just making music because it's fun to do, you know. So there's always yeah, that difference between like some people are motivated to do this for career, some people are motivated to do this just because they enjoy it. Yeah. And so that was me. So like, I don't know if I kind of touched on this earlier, but even when I made the make pop music group, um, people were, you know, offering to pay me every now and then just because my mixes were solid and they needed somebody that did solid mixes for a low price point. But like, it never really was about the money or making it a career. Like I never obsessed about like, oh, this is going to be my career. I'm going to like make this group and make this YouTube channel and I'm going to funnel in these sales and I'm going to have like this technique and this tactic. It was more so about like, how much music can I make for myself? How much music can I make for other people? And then people just started kind of like naturally coming along and being like, hey, can I pay you? Hey, can I pay you? Hey, can I pay you? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they do that enough that you do start to develop that. Like, okay, I have value. I can do this. So like I started producing at 18. I probably got my first paying client at 20. Um, and at that point, I had probably made two or 300 songs for myself, just complete demos that nobody had ever or probably will ever hear. And then once I was 20, I spent about a year, uh, about a year and three or four months um, just getting, you know, one client here, one client here. I made the Facebook group. People started hiring me from that because for some reason they thought, hey, this guy made the group. He knows what he's doing. And, um, I made a lot of really, really good relationships and all of those first clients I made became really, really, really long friends. And I've worked with them on almost everything that they've done since then, um, you know, three or four years ago. <clears throat> and so it never became like, this is going to be like my business model or my tactic. And it's been hard to try to teach the business side of things because I kind of accidentally stumbled into it. So it's taken a lot of thought after the fact to figure out like, what was my business model, even though it was accidental. So then maybe I can tell people, but, um, I think that that's why the group has done so well is because it never really was about that. Like, even when I went full time, I was working as a, a bookseller at Barnes and Noble. And like, I was a full-time college student. So mm -hmm. my, my scholarships and stuff like that were paying for most of my bills in my school. And me and my wife both worked full time. And that was just for, you know, spending money and just to cover whatever wasn't covered by all the other stuff. So I was like, I don't have to make that much money doing production. And I've still got about a year of school left. So this will give me a really good time to A, just not work a retail job, B, develop my production skills, and then C, see if this is something that I can do forever. So I did that. I started that um, in May of 2016. That's when I went like full-time, full-time. And then I graduated in May of 2017. Um, and by the time I graduated, I knew I was like, I'll never have to teach. I'll have a career in music forever. Like the group had uh, grown good feeling. Yeah. And it, I think that it was, I, I didn't fully decide I was not going to teach until February before I, so like three wait, or four wait, months before wait, you I are graduated. Teaching. <laughs> but you are teaching. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean like, you know, in a public school. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But that's, what's so cool about this is like, I get to use, you know, the $45,000 education that I paid for. Yeah. And, uh, I get to use it on my, on my own terms and on my own accord. And I think that that was really only possible because I never obsessed about the money part. And, you know, things change like now that I run the business and that my wife works with us and everything is in house. Like I do have to worry about the finances of all of it because it's my full-time job. Sure. And not only is it my full-time job, but it's also multiple businesses that we've invested in. And so now it, now it, becomes a little bit about the money in a professional sense. But when I was growing and when I was trying to learn production, like I didn't give a shit if I ever made a dollar from it. Like I just wanted to do it because I was obsessed with doing it and I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember that feeling and I certainly enjoyed um, going through that myself. I mean, like I remember when I was first getting in a car with my buddy to go do field recording, just literally just driving across the country. We'll just record whatever we find. Um, I, I would, he'd ask me if I wanted to go on a two week trip in a car car across the country. And I'd look at what I had in the bank and I was like, um, yeah, I only got 200 bucks. Okay, sure. <laughs> you know, just wouldn't even care about the results of it. And, and I think that that's really empowering and it really allows you to, to have the opportunity to just put in enough hours to really get, you know, improve at your craft. And so like you talked about doing two or 300 demos before you were worried about whether you're making money with them. And that's important. You need that safe place to grow with your skill set before you feel like you've got pressure on that's going to really influence your decision making process. Um, mm -hmm. So, what, one of the things you mentioned was uh, um, a little while back, you dropped a term called top line, and I remember that Daniel Grimmett was the first person I ever even heard that term from. And I and I love that you guys have these these approaches to making music that are 
new and different from what I'm used to with bands and, and being in the studio. So tell us what what is the top line and talk maybe about also some of the different um, responsibilities or the different uh, uh, skill sets that you can have in making pop music where you don't have to do everything, but maybe you could focus on delivering this one part of the production process. Yeah, for sure. So um, we can definitely dive into the top line and we'll dive into a couple different just I guess, jobs or things that you could put on your website to offer. So top line is typically what people will also just call a writer. So they're writing the lyrics and the melody. And the reason that I specifically say top line is because it's really nice to know that you're only talking about the vocal lyrics and melody. Because when a lot of people say, hey, I'm a songwriter, they really mean that they're a composer or an arranger. Well, they're where they can, you know, build an instrumental and they'll call themselves a writer. So there's Mm -hmm. kind of gotten to be this gray area of, Hey, I'm a writer. It's like, okay, well, do you, do you compose and arrange or do you, you know, top line, do you like write, write? And so that's why typically, um, I'll say, Hey, I offer top lining services and I always explain what it is. And as somebody's wanting to hire me for it, um, you know, you explain what they get. So you're just, okay. Um, you need vocals, you need a lyric, you need a melody. Um, I can do a demo recording and send that back to you with a lyric sheet. If you need any help structuring the song, I can do that as well. And then that's top lining. It's typically what a songwriter actually is. Right. So and now then, if you do that for somebody, is that, um, maybe this is premature for me to ask this question, but is that typically considered a work for hire where somebody's just sort of buying a song from you or, or do you still need to know about things like your, your copyright in a song and, you know, registering with BMI and ASCAP and all that kind of stuff. And and let me know if that's too, if I'm getting too advanced with that question too soon. No, it's an amazing question because everybody asks it, especially with writing more so than even production or beat making or anything like that. Um, so I think that that's really up to you and the client or the artist that you're negotiating with. So typically what I do, um, and I I won't give out rates or anything like that because they're just kind of always changing and they're very project dependent. But what I do when somebody hires me to write is, A, I make sure that it's a track that I even want to write on. And then B, um, I just kind of determine... I typically like to take back in for songs that I'm writing just in case because they have that lyric and that melody that I can only use one time. Um, So I'll take back in. But what I like to do is I like to also make a little bit of money up front because let's be 100% honest, for a song to make me even a couple hundred bucks in back end, it would have to sell thousands and thousands of, well, it would have to stream, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of times or sell, you know, a thousand or two copies when you're splitting that between me, another writer, the artist, any label or publisher that's in it. So I don't focus too, too much on back end unless it's an artist that I really believe I'll be able to make it in. Typically, um, I'll still have it there just to kind of like, you know, CYA. And then um, other than that, I- I'll typically either take an advance or I'll take what I like to call a session fee, which is basically like they have to pay me for the two or three hours that it takes for me to record the vocals, not necessarily write them because like I'll send them back recorded vocals. Um, they're tuned, timed, all of that kind of stuff. So I, I charged them for the time and then I charged them for the idea on the back end. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So top line is helping people, you know, finish out a song by, by adding the vocal, the lyric, the melody, um, mm-hmm. when somebody's, you know, maybe starting with the track and the beat and the, you know, keyboard parts and the bass line and all the, all the stuff that sort of is the, you know, the band in the box element of, of doing music. What are some other aspects? I guess the other side is, you know, you certainly have people who are like, I make beats and I've, that's a question I get. I get, it's like, do you make beats? Do you make beats? And if you're not making beats, then you're like, I don't know. What is that? <laughs> so tell, tell, tell people what it means to make beats or the other aspect of the production. Yeah. So now, um, people commonly call them beat makers or they're, they're most often now just producers. Um, and those are basically the people that are working on the composition and the arrangement. So on, you know, a major album, you might see somebody either credited as uh, a composer an arranger a programmer, which is somebody who like actually goes in and like makes all the synth sounds and the drum th- sounds and stuff like that, or a producer. Um, and typically what makes them just a composer or a ranger or um, a programmer is if they weren't part of that project from the start and they were hired on by somebody to do something. So like a producer 
is like somebody comes to me as a client or as an artist and like, Hey, I need a song. Can you do that? I take the song as a producer and I'm like, yes, I'll do whatever I need to make sure the song comes out super sick. And so my job as a producer is to get that song where they need it to be. And that might include making the beat. That might include doing all the programming and the arrangement. That might include doing all the sound design. That might even include, you know, hiring a mix engineer, hiring a mastering engineer, kind of facilitating all of those things. Uh, Similar to like a a producer, an executive producer has always done. You're kind of the head of the project. But that's why producers aren't always the people that are necessarily making the beat. That's why sometimes you'll see like produced by DJ Khaled and then composed, arranged and programmed by 14 other people. It's because DJ Khaled probably just sat in a room pointing fingers. You know, Quincy Jones did the same thing. It's one of those kind of overhand approaches. So a producer can either do that or they can also dive into a lot of those smaller, more niche kind of work for hire elements. So like typically with my productions, I am the producer, but I also do all the composition, the arrangements, all of the sound design. A lot of the time I'll even mix and master the songs that I'm producing. So typically I just go by producer because I'm doing all those things anyway. But like if there was, you know, let's say I needed somebody to like track guitar and I wanted them to just lay down their own idea, I would hire a guitarist and he would now be A, the session guitarist, and B, he would now be in a, a composer and arranger on the track because he actually added an element of the track. So you could have quite a lot of people on a on a f- final recording. There could be Somebody oh, yeah, who's 20, yeah, 20, 30 people on it. That's pretty amazing. All right, cool. Well, so, hey, let's take a break for a moment, and then we'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstars, a reminder that I'll have links to stuff we're talking about, including a YouTube playlist that'll take you right to Austin's channel, and we'll have links to the uh, Make Pop Music Facebook group, so you can go check that out. Um, and we'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Otherworld Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock. OWC will help take your studio far into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. If you want to design and build a great house, then you're going to need great tools. You could build it with an old hammer and some nails, but it's a whole lot easier to use an air compressor and a nail gun. Well, the same thing goes for mixing. If you really want to create a pro-sounding mix, then it makes a lot of sense to start with a great toolbox of awesome plugins. This is where Boz Digital Labs comes in to help you get killer mixes easily, quickly, and creatively. Provocative will make your vocals sound lush and wide. Transgressor and Manic Compressor can help your drums leap out of the speakers. Katie Wadey and Big Beautiful Door offer unique new ways to tighten up your tracks, while The Wall will make sure your mixes are in your face and competitive. And my favorite is Sasquatch Kick Machine, which can transform your kick drum from sounding like a home studio cardboard box into the perfect punchy kick without using samples or triggers. To download your unlimited trial of any plugin now or get one of Boz's free plugins, go to bozdigitallabs.com and put the best in your mixing toolbox. Click the link below in the show notes to learn more. If you want to capture every nuance of a great performance in your studio, then you need to start with a microphone that is crafted with great care and attention to detail. Jay-Z Mics in Riga, Latvia designs amazing sounding microphones that are handcrafted with jeweler's precision to bring you incredible detail in your recordings. At the heart of Jay-Z Microphones is the unique Golden Drop capsule design, which uses a lighter, faster diaphragm that delivers great clarity and fidelity while avoiding distracting color 
aberrations and distortions. Make sure to check out the Black Hole series BH1S and BH2 with the awesome looking hole in the middle of the mic, combining innovative industrial design with meticulous electrical engineering to help your studio sound incredibly expensive for an affordable price. Jay-Z offers a five-year warranty, free shipping to the US, and 30-day money-back guarantee. Plus, for a limited time, if you use the coupon ROCKSTAR, you will get an astonishing 50% off. I got one. You're hearing my voice right now on the BH1S. So what are you waiting for, rock stars? Go to jayzmike.com or click the link in the show notes below. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Austin Hall, joining us from Orlando, Florida, or at least pretty close to Orlando, right? Oh, I'm I'm smack in the middle of Orlando. I'm 15 minutes to Disney, 15 oh, minutes to Winter Park. Sweet, I'm man. like, yeah, I'm like 10 minutes from the Civic Center, dude. Dude, it's, I was it's just <laughs> in your neighborhood recently. We went down there for spring break, and I, I should have called you, man. We should have had a coffee. Um, dude, let me know next time. I am literally always here. All right, cool, man. So, rock stars again. Austin is Make Pop Music. That is his brand, website, YouTube channel, thriving Facebook group. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. So make sure you go check that out. Um, and I recommend that you check it out, even if you're not, if you don't consider yourself already making pop music or you or you're not sure what that's all about. I think you'll find a lot of great production tips and and helpful stuff in there. And again, a great community. And then a reminder, of course, go check out the recording studio Rockstars Facebook group as well, rsrockstars.com slash FB. And then you can join that group and get in on some conversations there as well and help us make grow that one to an awesome Facebook group. So um Austin. Let's jump into some more questions about uh, producing pop music. Um, sure. You know, this is kind of a, a general question, but maybe you can answer it how, however you see fit. What do you feel like is a smart way to build a pop track? Um, I mean, it's, it's definitely dependent on what people like. I typically either go with chords or main vocal melody first. Um, and you'll see this a lot. We've done a couple different videos on the on the YouTube channel where I like build a, a pop song from scratch. So I'll do like an Ariana Grande style song or a loud song. We just launched a Billie Eilish one today as me and you were chatting. Great. And typically with all of those, I start with just uh, chords and a, a, just a vocal. So like to me, a song needs to be able to come back to just like an acoustic guitar or a piano and the vocal and still be a good song at heart. Um, without hiding behind a bunch of production gimmicks or a bunch of, you know, vocal layering and stacking like that. So that's typically where I like to start just to kind of get that litmus test done pretty early. Yeah. Um, and then what are, when you say chords, what are you even picturing? Are you talking about like, um, some, uh, MIDI notes drawn out and it's synths that are just, you know, switching notes, or is it like you're playing some chords on a piano or are you using a piano sound? Just, you got any good advice for people just like how to start thinking about, what, what what instrument we start with to get inspired with these chords? Yeah, that's a great question. So it depends on the style of song that I'm going into. So if I'm going into something that I know is going to be pretty stripped um, and pretty organic, I'll typically start with either just playing a piano or playing an acoustic guitar and just kind of going to some of the chords that I go to most often and then figuring out just how to switch that up and, you know, add extensions, kind of swap some things around. So that's a really, really good place to start. But let's say that somebody hires me to write a song that sounds like Migos or something, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm, what I'm typically going to do for that is I'm going to, I'm not going to write a Migos style song over a piano. That's just, it's not going to work. So what I'm typically going to do is I'm going to just kind of go through some presets or if I have a sound in my mind and I know sound design, um, make an initial patch for like a main melody that's going to carry through. So like with Migos, I'd probably start with some kind of like pluck melody or bell melody or some kind of like world ethnic percussion kind of, uh, melody, something like that to where I'm going to have a really, really percussive melody that's got some rhythm, it's got some melody, and then I can kind of start layering over some kind of vocal over that. Then I'll probably go in and start adding a bass line under that, and then I'll go in and start layering up percussion. So I typically build it with whatever style of song I'm writing. I start with the most important thing first, get that out of the way because that's got to be the showstopper, and then I'll just fill it in with the production techniques. Okay, so um, it sounds like you're beginning with an inspiration, like you, you, you are looking to a particular pop artist for the inspiration and for the nugget of a first idea. And then you're letting that guide you. Do you find it valuable to ever just go into write and you're like, I have no idea what I'm going to do at all. So when I write for myself, I go in with no preconceived notions, but when I'm writing for clients, almost everybody's going to have some kind of reference that I have to make sure that I'm keeping in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and typically even when I'm chatting with a client about like, Hey, what, what sound are you going for? Because 
I'm not going to lie. I'm not, I'm not trying to sit here and go through 14 different, you know, song starts, uh, to find a vibe that they like. So I'd rather just get a reference, but instead of saying like, Hey, what artist do you want to sound like? Or what artist do you want to use as a reference? Because every artist is going to be like, well, I'm unique. You know, I don't, I don't sound like Ed Sheeran. I don't sound like Bruno Mars. Right, right. Um, and what, what I say is like, Hey, if, if you were on a Spotify playlist or if you were on a tour, what artist would go before your song and what artist would go after your song? Uh, because they have to fit man. in the middle brilliant. of that. And so that's a way for them to kind of put themselves in a ballpark without saying, I have to sound exactly like them. Right. Vibe has to be similar. Arrangement and composition has to be kind of similar to where it's smooth. It's a smooth transition for, say, somebody who likes Bruno Mars to come listen to somebody like you. But I'm not going to go ahead and add in a talk box and make every sense sound like, a, you know, a Jupiter or a Juno. Um, I just have to make it sound like it could come next on a playlist. Well, so that's brilliant because, I mean, ever since I started doing music, the the difficult question that nobody wants to answer is, um, oh, yeah, what kind of music do you do? And they're like, mm-hmm. oh, now I have to categorize what I do. And I love that, um, you know, even what you're talking about with with Spotify is something that can exist across all genres of music. It's like, if you were going to be on a playlist, if you were going to, uh, you know, you're a party and you're going to play your song next to some others, what what other songs might you play at the same time? And that's such a great way to help people begin to sort of describe and categorize their music without mm-hmm. feeling sort of, without it feeling oppressive. 100%. And you can still have unique qualities in that. That's why I kind of position it like that. Because if I ask somebody what artists they want to sound like, they're going to tell me you know, insert whatever generic pop artist. And then they're going to have really specific things about that that they want me to use. So they might want me to use the same bass sound. They might want me to use the same kind of progression. Um, So that's why I really prefer to get people kind of out of those really specific references and more into like, hey, let's put a playlist together of, it's almost like a mood board, right? So like if you ever hire a designer, um, you might hit them up with a mood board where somebody's designing you a logo, but you've got like a picture of a pink flamingo and like the Miami sunset strip. And then that can kind of let them know what kind of font they need to make for your logo. Um, I like to do that with production to where people kind of give me this canvas of things that they enjoy that are not necessarily exact references. I even ask a lot of the time, like, you know, what someone's favorite color is or kind of what they like to do just to kind of fit their mood. in, so it's as authentic as possible because it's really easy to lose that authenticity when they've got me writing and producing most of the song, especially from a distance because all of my clients are online. So I, I like to get as many of those personal elements as I can just to make sure I can try to include them. And one of those is definitely figuring out what artists they're going to be side by side with. Yeah. And I think that's actually good advice, even for writing your own music. I mean, sometimes we can be like, oh my God, what am I going to write about? What I mean, like, maybe I'm pretty good at guitar. Maybe I could play something that sounds a little bit like distorted metal, or maybe I could play something that sounds a little bit like, uh, you know, a banjo or folk. Which direction do I want to go? And if you surround yourself with some inspiring music, and just let let yourself go in that direction. Maybe that's a good way to start. So there was a couple of terms that you dropped a moment ago. You said sound design and patch. Can you break mm-hmm. those down for us? Yeah, so sound design is basically anything from making kind of like a synth preset to creating your own drum samples to carrying around a field recorder with you to just carry, uh, you know, to record birds tripping outside that you can use in your production. It's basically just how you develop those sounds that are going to be in your stuff. So I really, really advise people getting into production, composition, programming, arrangement, all that kind of stuff to learn sound design, like learn how to go into something like Serum or Massive, you know, one of those synth programs and learn kind of what the attack, decay, sustain, release, learn what those do, learn what a LFO is, learn what modulation is. Because when you can learn all those things, when you hear a sound in your head in the shower that you're like, wow, that would be super sick. You have that tool now. You can just go on your computer and you can make it in five or 10 minutes That's cool. instead of having to flip through a million presets um, and wasting a ton of time and getting distracted. So I think sound design is super, super crucial. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with using presets. I use them all the time, especially as a starting point. But it's nice to know that when I have something specific in my head that I know for sure I want to do, I can just make it myself and not have to figure out who did the best version of what I'm picturing. Yeah, and Um, also I would encourage rock stars, um, when you are exploring presets on synth sounds, virtual instruments, um, sometimes it can be daunting because you flip through and and you play and you're like, that's cool, that's cool, but I don't know, what's the next one? That's cool, that's cool, but I don't know, what's the next one? And... If you just simply find one and then start grabbing knobs and changing it, it can so quickly become something different. And then, you know, you begin to you begin to sculpt it into something that you like. Um, and it can be I find it can be easier to arrive at a at a 
finish line by just picking any preset that's kind of cool and then start changing it. Now it's something totally different and new. 100%. I like to find something that's between 60 and 70% there. Like, you know, of course, you want to make sure if I'm looking for a bass sound, I'm not like pulling up plucks and stuff like right, that. Right, right. But then when you pull it up, if you're like, oh, like this sounds cool, but maybe cut out some of the high end. So you add like, you know, a filter where the cutoff is pretty low. And then maybe you want to widen it so you can drive the voicing up and then you can detune it. Like there are all these different elements that you can do that even when you're flipping through presets, you're like, that preset is lit, but I need to make it Austin. I need to not make it, you know, whoever designed this preset for serum and sure. having those tools and knowing how that synth works um that's that's really really key to a not only make your own presets that you can use or just make your own sounds on the spot but how to turn everything else into your sound um cool man so one of the things that you mentioned a moment ago is you talked about you used the word patch so what does mm -hmm. that mean to somebody who doesn't know what that is yeah so a patch is just what we basically call like a preset so like if you're in a synthesizer um and i'm like hey can you pull up like a pluck patch. I just want you to pull up a, a pluck preset. So that's just another word for like a preset. And we call it patch because typically with like sound design um, and synthesis and stuff like that, you end up having to patch things together through what are called matrix matrixes. And um, if you've ever seen like the big kind of modular synth racks on people's walls where they have, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cables going from here to there, from here to there, massive patch base. Um, that's just kind of how it's, it's just game, the terminology patching. Yeah, so. back in the day, it was pretty cool. And then they started bringing it back with um, Reason was the first one to mm -hmm. bring bring the patch cable onto the computer screen because you could flip all the gear around and see the back and, and cable it all together. Um, and then uh, SoftTube has a wonderful modular synth plug-in, and I'm sure there's a bunch out there that mm -hmm. kind of lets you do that sort of thing and, and recreate the modular synthesis world. It's so deep, dude. I took synth classes in college and a little bit in, in high school, I was I was lucky to go to schools that had those. Um, and it was just, it's so exciting when you begin to learn that world. But you're absolutely right. You have to really dedicate yourself to it if you want to get good at it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I am by no means like a sound design expert. Um, if I hear something, most of the time I can make it. But I mean, for all of these like dubstep guys that have got these synths that will basically like speak a full sentence to you and stuff like that, <laughs> I, I can't do that kind of stuff. That's that's way beyond me. If you need like some plucks or some pads or like a bass sound or whatever, I'm your man. But if, if you're wanting something to where you're going through like seven different, you know, Euro rack synthesizers and stuff like that and patching them together, that that's not me. <laughs> all right, cool. Well, so um, what, what tips do you have for people who want to reverse engineer production like you did with Ariana Grande? Yeah. So the, the key to that is that's a really good question. It's really just breaking down the elements of what makes her, her, right? So, um, like in that video, we talk a little bit about just kind of analyzing the, the past couple songs she's done. And I do this typically when artists give me a very specific reference that they want is you have to find out what elements of those have to stay and what elements are up to your own interpretation, because sometimes you don't really have a lot of leeway. So with the Ariana Grande song, I remember saying like, she uses hip hop drums. So we have to have with yeah, we have to go with like hip hop drum samples. A lot of the time she's using like really jazzy chords. So let's like throw in some sevenths and some ninths. Um, she's been using a lot of like atmospheric type plucks, very hip hop driven production. And then in terms of like her melody, you kind of just have to, you know, is she dropping off on words? Is she raising her melody at the end of phrases? Is she going short, fast, and staccato? Is she staying long and lengthy? What are some subject matter she's singing about? What kind of rhyme scheme does she typically go with? And then you kind of piece it all together. Does she go with, you know, bridge, pre-chorus, chorus, chorus uh, or verse, pre-chorus, chorus, chorus um, kind of do her songs have bridges? What's mm -hmm. the length of them? So there's all these things to break down in a song. I typically like to break it down into big categories. So rhythmically what's going on. Um, and then melodically what's going on in terms of like bass melodics. So like you have your bass melody and then your main chord patches and stuff like that. So I like to call that like the bed of music and then what's going on with lead melodies. So your vocals, any synth lead lines, and then you've got your sound design and then you've got your arrangement. So if you break it down into those five things, at least for production, you should be able to kind of get in the same ballpark if you're keeping those things in mind. Yeah, that's cool. And it's encouraging to know that, you know, when you when you first look at something, you're like, oh my God, how do I ever sound like that? But when you if you just pause for a minute, take a breath, take a deep breath, and then just like listen to each individual element. I remember in grade school, our music teacher used to make us do that. He put a record on and then you had to listen and like try and pick out the instruments that were playing in the orchestra or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's just a smart training. 
And when you begin to simplify it, you might realize that you're very capable of figuring out like what that one part is doing. And it's a lot simpler than you ever thought too. That's probably the thing that you find out more than ever is just like, it's not that complicated. Do people would be astonished if, if they knew how simple the synth patches that are in these main songs are, how simple the chord progressions are, how simple it is to write a melody like that. And that's the thing that I see with smaller producers and writers. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I am a small producer and writer. Um, I'm still a small fish. But that I see with with most up and coming guys is like they just put way too much stuff in it. It's just way too crowded. Um, it's just not simple. Everything is kind of overly just like stuff to the point to where you can't really interpret anything that's happening because they were so worried about just throwing in all of these tips and tricks and tools and these things that they know they weren't focused on just like dialing it back. And I mm -hmm. think that active listening is really, really crucial to being a producer or a mixing engineer or a songwriter. I mean, it's like with a math equation, right? So like you get to algebra two or, or pre-calculus or something like that. And your equation is basically you know, A parenthesis B divided by C parenthesis D squared equals 245. And you have to figure out what each one of those things mean. And that's kind of how it is with the song. Like you've got the song, which is 245. You know, you've got seven rings by Ariana Grande, which is the equation total. Then you have to figure out what is A. A is that she does this kind of rhythm. B is that she does this kind of chord progression. C is that she does this kind of vocal melody. D is that there are these kind of synth patches in there. And then you start to kind of put that equation together. And that's really all it is. You just have to break it down to the those key elements did it in the words of david bowie my brain hurts a lot <laughs> yeah that's that was a lot of numbers and letters. <laughs> well done though well done you you make a good teacher you got the skills thank um, you man i appreciate that what daw do you use um i i saw something on your screen that i didn't even recognize so what do you use um do you feel like it's important to start with the right daw and uh, do you have any tips for people about making sure that they're headed down the right path should they should they try and use all the daws so <sighs> I, I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty torn on DAW discussions just because to me, like ever since I got into audio, that's primarily been what forums have been about is which DAW is the best DAW. Right. So, so I actually, now I'm in Cubase 10 Pro. Um, and I love it. I love Steinberg. The support is incredible. Um, the, the staff there is really, really friendly. The reason I picked I didn't always use Cubase. The reason I transitioned to Cubase when I wanted to get really professional with it, um, I went to Cubase probably six or seven months before I went full time because I knew that Pro Tools was really, really sick if you were in a bigger studio setup, if you had kind of a rig, if you had outboard summing, if you were doing a lot of engineering and editing and stuff like that, like the actual, um, you know, track features, the arming features, all of the editing features are super, super sick in Pro Tools. And that's definitely to me what it was made for was uh, producing with more analog stuff, um, being able to edit and do, you know, really, really, really tight comping and stuff like that. That's Pro Tools' bread and butter. That's not my bread and butter. Um, I hardly record anything besides maybe vocals and guitar. Mm -hmm. Everything else is in the box unless I'm you know, either hiring somebody or going to a studio anyway. Mm -hmm. So I knew that Pro Tools wasn't for me. And then I just looked at some of the other ones. Logic looked incredible, but it's Mac only, and I'm a PC guy. Right, um, okay. So that got rid of Logic. And then I was really between Ableton, Studio One, or Cubase. I didn't want FL. I played around with some demos with FL. And to me, just like the sequencer is really cool, but it feels limiting to me. Like I felt like all I could produce was like trap records on FL Studio. Right. And which FL, is what it's, what it's FL Studio for. is Fruity Loops originally. Yeah, Fruity right? Loops for anybody yeah. that, that doesn't know. And then um, I really just kind of like looked into it. And honestly, the reason that I picked Cubase was because a new Cubase had just come out at the time. And I had some people that I was kind of writing with every now and then, and they used Cubase and they recommended it. And I looked and it had all of the tracking features I need. I could track and edit anything that I could in, in Pro Tools. So you kind of get all of that outboard summing and you've got a control room and you can set up, you know, four pairs of studio monitors and you can set up a talk back and all of those things that you would do in a major commercial facility. You can still do those on Cubase where in something like Ableton, it's a little bit more complicated because Ableton is much more electronic kind of MIDI based. Right. But right. at the same time, Cubase has incredible MIDI capabilities and functions. All of the, the, sounds and the VSTs they come with. Cubase is incredible. Steinberg does super, super sick work all around the board. Um, they've got built-in pitch editing. Now in Cubase 10, they've got built-in basically vocal line where I can take one vocal and uh, just click a button and all the other vocals match it. Ooh. And so like, yeah, it's killer. So like Cubase has a lot to offer. To me, they take the best things from the, the, uh, the DAWs that are very 
electronic based where it's mostly MIDI, mostly in the box, but then they still offer those features that some guys in Pro Tools might like with, you know, summing, comping, editing. Well, they, they started like out, um, you know, Cubase and Steinberg, you know, it started out as, a, I guess Cubase started out as a MIDI thing, but once they went to audio, um, it was very, it seemed very focused on, you know, wanting to record acoustic instruments or, you know, mm -hmm. record with a microphone. And it was one of the first things that seemed to have like, as I recall, I think it had EQ on each track already. You didn't have to add it. it. You know, you had reverbs that would come with the program. So for a long time, it's already been a pretty great sounding interface. Um, and then Rockstars, if you don't already know Chris Salim um, at Mixdown.online, his focus as well is on Cubase. And so there's a lot of great, uh, you can get a lot of, you know, insights into that there too. And then I have a friend here, John Painter, who's a great composer, and uh, I just learned that he's been using it for for decades, and and you know he swears by it. So I think I'm going to have to check out Cubase as well and, and learn more about it. I highly recommend it. Um, Chris is great. We actually just chatted the other day about doing some Cubase content, and um, actually one of the one of the Steinberg reps reached out to me, and we're going to be doing uh, a giveaway on the group with with Cubase 10 Pro, which is super super sick because I've been using it for years before I had the group or the channel or anything like that, and I just genuinely love it. So it was cool to hear that they've kind of heard about us, and and now they want somebody else to try it. So um, we'll we'll have more details about that coming. So if you're cool. in the group, you'll hear about it. But we're really excited. Um, a lot of composers. Use it because it has incredible composition features where you can score, you know, full orchestras in MIDI and then just like export all of the MIDI data and all of the sheet music. And they've got like, you can do 5.1. I think on Cubase 10, you can even do 11.1 now. So it's incredible. It's crazy. And then Cubase is really, really integrated with um, WaveLab, which is also made by Steinberg, which mm, a lot of yeah, like right. multimedia people will use for mastering. Yeah. So like if I need to, to master something for Spotify or iTunes or whatever, I can do that on Cubase really easily. But if I'm trying to, you know, master something for Dolby Digital or something like that, I'm going to WaveLab and it'll just pick your stuff up right from Cubase. So it's really, really sick for a lot of those people who are doing like Foley and um, cinematic stuff. So really, I just picked it because it was it was highly recommended. And once I tried it, I loved everything about it. And um, to the camp, to, you can make good music in any DAW. Um, that should not be your excuse. I, I made thousands of dollars making music on Mixcraft by Acoustica, which is like a $50 DAW. Um, ah, yeah, I've heard of Mixcraft, but I've never actually seen it. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to check it out, I recommend it for beginners because it comes with a lot of cool stuff. But, like, it's very limiting to me. And um, I just kind of I, I kind of moved past it and wanted a big boy DAW to where if I popped in a <laughs> commercial boy, studio, <laughs> if I popped in I a put commercial on my studio, big boy DAW one, one leg at a time. Man, That's great. Basically, like, I mean... I don't know. To me, it's it's like use use whatever works for you. They're all really, really different workflows. So if you try one and you don't like it, don't be afraid to go to another one. You know, Ableton yeah. is so different from Cubase, which is so different from Pro Tools, which is so different from well, Apple Studio. Let's, let's spin that back to you in the Spotify, the Spotify playlist context. Sure. People that you see using Ableton Live in your group, if you were to play something before them and after them in the playlist, what styles of music would you find that it's, uh, how would you describe it that way? Ableton's deaf electronic. So like, I would say you're going to hear stuff like the Chainsmokers, stuff like Flume, stuff like um, Marshmallow. You're going to hear stuff like all of the EDM, like Trap Nation channels. Um, you'll see on most of the EDM sound design synthesis kind of composition videos, almost all of them are using Ableton. Okay. All right. Dig it. Now, um, if you had to answer the same question for Logic Pro X, what, what would you say? Logic, I would say, is really similar to Cubase. So it's it's very eclectic. You get a lot of people who are doing a lot of different things. Um, Logic, I think, is really popular for pop. The reason a lot of people love Logic is because you get GarageBand free when you get your Mac, and Logic is basically the same interface. So if you you know make music for a couple of years on GarageBand kind of as a hobby, switching to Logic really feels no different besides there's thousands and thousands and thousands of more options of stuff that you can do. Yeah. But in terms of the actual layout, it's almost exactly the same. So I would say if you're a Mac person, Logic is, is super, super good for you. Okay, cool. Now, um, how would you answer that question regarding Reason? And is Reason still a, a, an important DAW tool for people to know about? I think Reason is sick. I think that Reason has done pretty well with doing Reason Rewire now to where you can use a lot of the elements of Reason in other native DAWs. Um, so like if, if I wanted to get Reason and then open up some kind of like Reason synth or Reason drum rack or something like that, um, a lot of the time you can do that with rewiring it into Cubase or, or Logic or whatever. I think that, that Pro a lot Tools of people... as well? Can I, can I be rewiring 
different DAWs into Pro Tools? Maybe. Is Pro Tools VST3 or is it? It's AAX. I don't know if you can do it with AAX. Okay. I've done it with VST3. Okay. Um, maybe though. I mean, I'd be surprised if you couldn't. But I, I think that a lot of people that use Reason are a little bit of the, I think it's the people that use Ableton now 10 years ago. Right, right. Okay, cool. Um, awesome, man. Well, I love just getting little insights into all these things. And I, and I think, think your answer was perfect. So let's talk about Thank mixing. You. Let's talk about mixing. Um, let's you, do Because um, we've talked about production, even though I could probably ask you a million questions about that. But let's say we've got some stuff. We're in Cubase. It's time to mix. What comments do you have about how you begin a mix? I mean, do you have templates that you start with? Do you have um, sort of a, a mental process? Do you you know, start with an espresso that's just right before you start your mix. What do you want to say about mixing? Super good question. So a lot of the people that watch this, um, not, not every producer mixes themselves. And most people would tell you that if you're a producer, don't mix yourself. The only reason that I mix most of the stuff I produce is because for years I mixed instead of production. Um, so I actually like started like mixing alongside. So I've just, I've been mixing as long as I've been producing. And to me, I kind of mix as I produce. So if it's something that I'm working on from the start, a lot of the time the mixing starts in the actual production. Like I never export stems the, of a song that I'm producing to take it into a different section to mix it. I just mix it in the same session and it's done. Um, right. so I would say that like, if you're a producer, who's going to mix your stuff, or if you're going to hire a mix engineer later, uh, definitely try to get it as right as you can in the initial stages. So like when you're, you know, bringing a, a kick sound that you like, but it's missing a little bit of low end, maybe focus a little bit more on the sound design of that kick and maybe put the EQ in then instead of just relying on the mixing engineer to do it. Because if you've got 150 tracks and each track needs a couple things done that you had in mind that you don't tell the mixing engineer, they're going to miss most of them. Yeah. They're going to do a couple things that they had in mind and not do most of the stuff that you had in mind. Well, I so think, remember, I think, I think um, most of the rock stars listening are probably mixing their own music. So maybe, sweet. maybe talking about it from the perspective of how do you separate them, you know, mentally that you're producing and mixing or, or just what is your process when you're doing your own stuff? Yeah. So when I'm, when I'm going to be mixing something that I'm producing, like I said, I just make sure that I'm keeping that in mind the whole time that I'm producing, because I want to make sure that by the end, by the end of me having the vocals in the song before I'm like, okay, this needs to be mixed. I should be able to export it, play it in a car. If the artist really wanted to release it, they probably could. What I'm doing on my production projects, it's, you know, quote unquote mixing after the fact is really just cleaning stuff up. So like final levels, um, chopping out breaths, you know, making sure that everything is fitting in the right space, maybe doing some extra EQ and compression. I'm not doing a ton in terms of mixing on my own records because I'm kind of doing it as I'm going. Mm -hmm. So I would say that like, if you are producing your own stuff and you're planning on mixing it, just try to nail it when you lay it down, man. Like when you lay down a kick and a snare, like make sure that kick and that snare pops really, really hard before you're like, okay, well, this is cool, but like when I get to the mix, it's really going to sound, you know, like a massive house kick, like just, just nail it. And then it's done. And then on songs that I'm specifically only mixing that I don't produce that other people produce and just hire me to like mix, mix. Um, it's a totally different process. Well, and so like, well, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep, uh, I'm going to try and keep you on your own set for just one sec, because let's say people have been working on theirs. They've been doing that, but they're like, I just know that there's some stuff I could be doing with like, you know, more clever mix oriented routing or buses or parallel stuff. Um, what are, do you start out with all the kind of parallel routing that you might want to do in the production phase? Or is, yeah. are there any, are there any quick tips for the rock stars about stuff that maybe they didn't realize they could add into their mix template to take what they're already working on and kind of like lift it up to enhance it up to the next level? <clears throat> Yeah, great question. So while I'm producing something, when I start a production, or even if I do get hired for a mix, it all starts at the same template. So I've actually made a video. So if you guys uh, want to check it out, definitely go on the Make Pop Music video where I explain my template, but I'll just kind of run it down pretty briefly for you. So everything starts with my same template. At the top, we've got my markers. And then right below that, we've got a tempo track. And then below that, uh, Cubase has what's called folders, which it doesn't do any routing. It's just for organizational purposes. So I have my drums folder. So when I'm laying in a kick or a snare or hi-hats or whatever, I'll just drag them in that folder. That way, if I don't want to look at drums, I can just collapse it. All of my drums are yellow. 
And then um, I also have a drums bus. So anything that's going in that drums folder actually gets routed to a drums bus, which is farther down in my session. And I do that same thing for drums, synths, uh, guitars, bass, lead vocals, background vocals, and then uh, what I call effects, which is just like ear candy, not to be confused with effects, as in like effects tracks or send tracks or anything mm. like that. So everything, basically every group of instruments has its own folder, and then all of those folders have their respective buses. So I'm not doing any processes on the actual folders. I'm doing processes within the actual tracks on those. And then my two buses for those are just kind of color coordinated with that. So if, you know, if I want to lay down something like a synth line, I'll make sure that as soon as I record that synth line, I route it to my synth bus and I drag it into my synth folder. So now my synth is highlighted green. It is routed everywhere. So then that way when you know, I'm getting later into the project. If we're starting to clip stuff, I can just turn my buses down instead of having to turn entire, you know, 40, 50 tracks down at one time. Um, cause with, with digital audio, you don't really have a problem with clipping unless you're clipping your two bus on the way out, like, right. app, like postmaster. Other than that, um, it's really just going to affect how hard you're driving into plugins. So like if you're using analog styled plugins, your gain will matter going into that because it's how hard it's hitting it. But just mm -hmm. in terms of like general, general clipping, you really have nothing to worry about unless you're clipping on the way in or clipping on the way out. And so that's why I like to have these like buses and stuff like that. So like if I have a really, really dense arrangement where like at the end it's clipping, I'll just drag all of my buses down by like five or 10 dB. And then none of my, you know, individual tracks are clipping. And now my buses aren't clipping. And now my master's not clipping either. So... That's okay, why I cool. do it like that. This show is sponsored by Recording Studio Rockstars Academy. Are you ready to take your recording, mixing, and mastering to the next level and make your best record ever? Then visit the Academy to find the course that's right for you. Want to record killer drums in your home studio? Then check out Rockstars of Drums to learn how to record, edit, and mix pro-sounding drums with a professional Nashville session drummer in a Grammy-winning studio. Or if you are ready to start mastering your own records at home, then check out Rockstars of Mastering, where I walk you through exactly how I mastered my own record, Skadoosh. Cool. Well, let me ask you a little bit about um, drum buses. Studio so, one. Yeah. You know, These I know you do a lot of production for you with whichever DAW you are like, using right mm, now. You know, and that if kind of mixing stuff. is your focus, um, then you're check also out doing my some free production that mix have got master the, the bundle, bundle where I show you how like to mix track, using stock and free plugins and feel the Plus, you get a look at how I recorded everything in my studio and multi-track downloads to mix in your own studio and even include in your mixing portfolio if you want. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to MixMaster.com bundle.com to get started for yeah, free so I now don't and look do for the clickable link in the show notes unless of this it episode. Is more organic style drum so like unless i'm using like something like superior drummer or actual drum tracks i'll throw on some compression and eq just to kind of brighten that up but in terms of electronic samples typically they're super processed they're super compressed and they're they're normally really bright so i typically don't do a lot of two bus with that stuff what i do is like my 808s that i use and stuff like that to where Typically, people will have one 808 patch where it's like the kick and that sustained sub bass all in one patch. Um, I just handle that in my sound design process. So like all of my bass are designed only as bases and then like I'll just layer that under a kick. So I've made kind of a tutorial where I make an 808 and, you know, some people in the comments were like, this is not an 808, blah, blah, blah. Um, because really it's just a sub bass and serum that I have that is Either A, I drag the attack up a little bit on the envelope so it doesn't hit right away. So when the kick comes in, it'll automatically duck it. Mm -hmm. Or B, I can just sidechain that bass to that kick or use something like track spacer where it's only going to sidechain the low end of that kick out. So a lot of the time, I don't like to have really, really sustaining low elements in my drum bus. If so, I'll just, I'll route them in my bass bus. So like I would never have like bass pads or um, like 808s or anything going into my drums bus because the only dr like low end that I want to focus in on that is like that transient low end from the kick drum. Because right. the if I have, 
Exactly. I want to focus on the punch with my drums and then I want to focus on the fullness with my bass. So yeah, typically I I just divide those up as totally separate elements. And, um, if I want to side chain something, I typically don't do it on the groups bus. I'll just do it individually. So like if I'm side chaining a synth, um, to like a kick drum or something like that for like an electronic song that has like those, those wobbles, Mm -hmm. um, I'll just comp all of the synths that I've layered that I want to comp down into one thing. And then I'll just side chain that whole thing to just a kick drum track. So, um, or I'll break it up to where like, say I have three chord patches that are all doing the same thing, but making one big layer. I'll comp those down. Say I have three leads. I'll comp that down to one lead. And then those will each get side chained because in Cubase, I think you can run like up to, I think like 10 side chains at one time. So I never really have ever needed more than that. Um, if I do, I would just make a new bus. So I would just call something side chain and then just do that whole bus. But I typically try to keep my buses pretty minimal because when I go to print stems and stuff like that later, most people want the individual multi-tracks and not the entire group stems. So if I'm doing a lot of bus processing and then they open up the, the vocals or the drums or whatever, and they're like, this sounds nothing like the final mix. And I'm like, well, it's because, you know, the drums bus had a, a ton of processing on it. They tend to be like, well, can you figure out how to make the snare sound like that? Like on the ah, actual snare stem? That's a good tip, man. That's a good tip. Good insight. Yeah. I mean, it's like you make sure that it's easy to export these tracks and have them still sound pretty close to what the finished version of the track sounds like. 100%. Yep. All right, cool. So, um, so that kind of answers, I think a little bit of the pumping mix thing. Um, and, uh, it's, it's good to hear you talk about both doing some side chaining also, you know, talking about like, you know, the, the side chain limit is 10 and that, that tends to be plenty. I think that's really insightful because sometimes people are like, do I need 50 side chains going on to do this? Um, but it's also cool to hear you talk about the sound design aspect of doing that stuff where a lot of times you may be actually sculpting it out of the the you know the the kick drum and the basses mm-hmm. and the synths individually to make it to give it this effect that sounds like the whole mix is kind of pumping even though it's actually a bunch of elements within it that are actually doing that it's kind of like when you look at that aria on a grande track and you're like oh my god it just I don't even know where to begin. It all just sounds great. How do I do this stuff? Sometimes I think the the kind of pumping EDM thing, if you look at it closely, you begin to realize, oh, you know what? It's really, it's just those synths that are doing the big bounce and that's what gives it that effect. But, yep. may, but maybe it's not the kick drum and the bass. Maybe they're, they're more constant. Yeah. And that's a big thing. I think that's one of the the key reasons I want people to kind of learn sound design and synthesis is because it's hard to find presets that have a lot of that movement and that bounce that you want. But with something like a wavetable synthesizer, like Serum or Massive or Anna by Sonic Academy or something like that, um, you can really draw in those shapes that you want. So if you want a sound to, you know, rise up and then rise down, you know, you just draw a triangle and on the LFO and you drag that to the volume and that volume is going to just slope up and then slope down. And then you can just set that to a rate. So like, I want that to do that on 16th notes. Now you've got a little wub, 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 and that's it. That's all it takes. It's yeah. like, it's super, super simple. And when you can nail it, then you don't have to put, you know, 40, 50 inserts on your freaking channel just to get a little <laughs> bit of movement. Yeah. Good tip, man. I like that. All right. Um, let's talk about vocals for a sec. So here you are sure. in Cubase. You've got sort of some built, built-in built vocal line features, some built-in tuning features. How important is tuning vocals in you know pop music? And you know, do you have any good tips for how to go through that process? Yeah. Okay. So I might I might catch a little bit of flack for this from anybody watching. So for it depends on the style of pop music again right so like if i'm writing something on acoustic guitar or piano or something a little bit more organic where those instruments are also going to have a little bit of leeway on being perfectly tuned or perfectly pitched right like if i play a g chord on a guitar it's not going to be a perfect g like no matter how good the guitar is how good the intonation is how good my tuning is it's just not like depending on how hard you press a fret where you are on the fret how hard you strum it there's always that little bit of give and take. So with something like that, I think you can get away with having your vocals be a little bit looser. Um, You know, we see it a lot of the time in in like Ed Sheeran's album. He doesn't tune a lot of stuff. He just comps a lot of stuff. And he can get away with that because that guitar might just be a couple cents sharp or a couple cents flat. So he doesn't feel completely disconnected from it. But if I have something like an Ariana Grande song where all of the cents are 
tuned to 440 and they're all perfect the entire time. All of the bass is perfect. All of the drum samples are actually tuned to the key of the song. And then we have a vocal that's a little bit off tune. It sticks out like a sore thumb. So for something like that, I think, yeah, it has got to be tuned to, to fit right in. Otherwise, it's just completely jarring because it's the only thing that is off just by a little bit. And then it makes it sound so much more off tune than it actually is. So I would just go in and I would tweak it. All right, cool. Uh, that's great advice, man. Um, let's see. Uh, do what about the process of learning how to tune vocals well? What are some um, What are some first uh, stumbling blocks? Some some first obstacles we're going to have to deal with when when we're first learning how to tune vocals. Like for example, do we start out by over tuning the vocals and we have to learn how to to back that off or anything like that? Yeah, that's funny that you say that because that's literally my method almost every time. So the hardest thing for me is figuring out the key of the song to figure out which notes are the right notes, especially if you have a vocalist that is pretty off, you know, by a semitone or two, almost every note, you're like, I don't know which note they were trying to sing. So figuring out what note is the right note sometimes is the hardest part. But when I'm starting, typically I like to tune in stages. It's kind of like compression to where if you compress and you get 20 dB of gain reduction, it's going to sound absolutely just crushed. But if you do, you know, five here, seven here, seven there with different compressors doing a little bit different things, it's going to sound a lot more gentle. So what I'll do is I'll go in very audio or, you know, if you're not in Cubase, you could go in like Melodyne or you can go in Autotune Pro on their graph section mm-hmm. or Waves Tune on their graph section. And I'll do graphical editing to make sure that every note is where it needs to be. And for that part, I'll basically tune it like T-Pain just to see kind of where those notes need to fall to make sure that none of that natural, um, you know, like just just kind of that natural warble that you get in vocals. They're like where yeah. something's a little sharper, a little flat. I want to make sure that I get the notes to the right section first. Once I get everything to the right notes, that's where I'll back off on that. And then I just really need to control where, you know, maybe they come in really sharp on a transient and I need to cut that and drag that down. Okay, cool. So, so you really dial, you like almost roboticize it to mm-hmm. make sure you've got the right, you know, uh, skeleton exactly, of the melody. Exactly, the right root notes. Exactly. Right root notes. Yeah, and, and you're so right. I mean, it's pretty amazing once you start tuning vocals to realize just just how often vocalists just completely blow off passing tones, you know? Exactly. I do so, it myself, you know? Yeah, so I think that's that's really the key is like get the vocals where they need to go and then you can really focus on preserving that tone and that realism. And so what I'll do is I'll tune them by hand to get them where they need to go. And then I'll ease off on them to where they're really just pushed to the right note. I'm not even, unless there's something that's pretty off, I'm not really straightening out or leveling out that note at all. And then what I'll do is pretty much first in my chain, I have auto tune pro and I'll set that to the key of the song, set the retune anywhere between like 20 and 30 and let that catch those little peaks because Mm. it'll do it a bit more naturally than I would by hand. So Really, it's just pretty light tuning on hand tuning and then pretty light tuning with auto tuning. And then by the end, you shouldn't be able to tell that really either one was done. It's kind of like a Long Island iced tea, like all the alcohol kind of cancels <laughs> itself out. Um, and that's that's how it is with tuning. It's weird because wow. you would think like the more stuff I have, it's going to sound more robotic. But uh, if you go lighter with it, it's so much easier. Austin, the, the all the alcohol cancels itself out in a Long Island iced tea only when you're still about 24 years old, not when you're 51. <laughs> 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 Only for the taste, man, not for the effect. <laughs> but All right, cool, yeah, man. That's, that's 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 my thing with uh with vocal with vocal tuning. I say go lighter. If you need to go harder, go go a little harder later. I would rather yeah, send no, something back tip. and somebody that's tell tip. me, you know, it needs a little more tuning than them be like, I can't even hear myself anymore. Right, right. Well, I certainly have had people say that it sounds uh, you know, that they don't like the tuning, and then I go and I just turn it off in that spot and they're like, Oh yeah, that's much better. But like, but it's back to some kooky note or whatever. And, you know, it's always, it's like that sweet spot between having a vocal in tune, but having it feel to the singer, like it still sounds natural. It still makes sense to the ear, you know? So how, exactly. how what, what about like, you know, what, what's a typical amount of time that it might take to tune a vocal and, um, you know, help the rock stars know if they're taking not enough time on it or way too much time. Um, you mean just like per vocal track? So like if I have a song that's like a lead, you know, four harmonies, three, you mean just like per track? Yeah. yeah, However you want to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I take a little bit longer with my leads than I do like with my stacks and harmonies because I do like to tune my stacks and harmonies quite a bit harder. And the harder you're tuning stuff, the less time you need to spend on it because you just get it to the right place. You don't have to worry about like keeping that real human quality. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and then that'll just make it super, super tight. So a lot of the time I'll, I'll do, you know, duplicates and harmonies and stuff like that. I mean, five minutes for a whole song per track. And then for like my main vocal, I would say I've, it's probably been forever since I've spent longer than 20 minutes tuning an entire song. Ah, I dig it, vocal. man. That's why you're fast. So that's good. I'm glad I asked that question. Cubase, very audio makes it super easy. You can even put in the key of the song and it'll like highlight the notes that you need to be tuning to. Um, so it's, it does the work almost for you. And then combining that with auto-tune that literally does the work for you is super simple. That's awesome. And I know that Studio One includes Melodyne on each track mm -hmm. if you want. Um, and I know that for me, you know, using Pro Tools and Melodyne, um, I've always found that I needed to take some time to export all my files over, bring them into Melodyne, then start working on them in there, then export them back out, bring them into Pro Tools. And then if you got to make changes, you go back to Melodyne, make a change, export it, bring it back in. So um, it sounds like you're, you've probably, you know, Cubase is probably a great choice for doing this stuff with, with real speed as well. Yeah, because Very Audio is a native plugin. So like if I click on it, it's it's just there. Like it doesn't even attach itself as an insert. It's like real time processing. Um, and then it's always there. So you can always take it on or off. So I don't have to bounce anything. I don't have to freeze anything. I don't have to bring it back in. It's just there. And if somebody tells me later that they want it eased up, I just double click on the vocal track. Very audio opens up and I highlight it, pull it back or I turn it off or whatever. And then um, Autotune Pro, they have the, it's kind of like a similar feature that Melodyne has where you kind of like take a snapshot of the section where it'll record it and then you have to kind of have to go back to it. But then once you take that snapshot of the vocal, it's there. So I would say if you're in Melodyne and you're having to like export tons and tons and tons of stuff, maybe try Autotune Pro because the graph section um, is a little bit more DAW friendly, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, creating content too. So uh, we don't have to go deep into this, but I know that you know you you have put in a lot of time and experience making YouTube videos. You know, you've created this Facebook group but particularly creating videos and some of the tools that go into it. You know, here I am making a podcast. And I think a lot of our listeners may be thinking, I, I get it that creating content is sort of part of the new world. And if I want to succeed with my production, with my recording studio, I need to learn more about, you know, how do I make have a YouTube channel and do some of this, you know, teaching and, and um, sharing and stuff like that. So what are some of the tools that you have found really useful when it's time to make a video and do you have any insights? I mean, we, before we did this, we were chatting about it a little bit. We talked about stuff like OBS and you, you talked about using a, a second camera and a lavalier mic and stuff like that. Uh, do you want to just give us some, some uh, insights into that world? Yeah, for sure. I'd love to. So my rundown is, it's pretty simple. Um, and even the stuff that I have, you can do the same thing, even with more budget friendly um, kind of models of those. So basically um, on my computer, what, what I do is I have OBS that's going to capture all of the actual, um, screen cap. And then to get the sound from Cubase to OBS, I have this extra program called voice meter and they're both free actually. So you just download voice meter. And then what I do is I go into Cubase and I switch my driver instead of being my Apollo UAD driver, I just select voice meter. So now Cubase is going to go out to voice meter and then I select voice meter to go into OBS. So now OBS is capturing the audio DAW or the DAW audio. And this is on a PC. Meter. This is on a PC. Okay. I believe that they both work though for Mac as well. Um, and if voice meter doesn't, Soundflower does something very, very similar for Mac. Yeah, and so, I, I use something called I Show You. So that's sort mm -hmm. of a, a more recent version of Soundflower. Um, Sweet. I'm on a Mac. OBS Rockstars stands for Open Broadcasting software or something like that. Yeah, and software it, system or something. Yeah, it's an open source free um, tool, an app that you can download a PC or Mac. And it's pretty incredible. It allows you to capture your screen, capture video, capture audio inputs. Um, you can really get flexible with it, but it's got a little bit of a steep learning curve and you just have to experiment till you kind of get your system working, you know? Yeah, it definitely took a little while to figure out the routing of how to get my DAW audio into there. And then just kind of like trial and error, figuring out how to get my voice into the videos, but not get like the speaker input and stuff like that. So basically that's how my computer works. And then I also have a, a just a Logitech webcam that I'll use if I want to like live stream to the Facebook group or if I'm going to Skype with somebody or do something like that. I don't typically use it for like my video videos, um, but it's nice to have that for when somebody needs it. Yeah. And then... Um, for audio, for my, for my videos, I have the Panasonic Lumix G7 as my camera and 
so I'll, I'll record a camera, a visual basically to everything that I'm doing in my doll. And then I have a lavalier mic, which is just those little mics that you pin on your collar, uh, that goes into my camera. So all of my voice is going into my camera and all of my computer audio is going into my screen capture. And then what I do is my, uh, my wife who works with me full time, she edits all of the content. So she just drags in the screen capture and then the camera video syncs them up. And then basically whenever the speakers are playing and my lav mic is capturing that, she just chops that out to where it's only the screen capture. And that's, that's basically it. And then if I want to do anything, um, you know, like this podcast or like live streaming on Facebook or something like that, I can just run my SM seven B into the line input of my Apollo. And then you can just select like on Skype or on OBS line input Apollo. And that's basically it. So that's just going into my Apollo. I don't even need voice meter or anything for that. So that's super simple, but my main up is definitely uh, OBS and voice meter for the screen cap and then Panasonic Lumix G7 and uh, laugh mic for the actual video and then my speaking audio. That's cool. And then with your fancy camera, the Panasonic, do you sometimes feed that in uh, into OBS so that you have the video just going right there for a live stream or anything like that? Or would that be where you would want to use the, uh, the Logitech camera? Yeah, so I haven't done that. Um, just because when I was looking at it probably like a year ago, some of the converters and interfaces and stuff like that were kind of pricey and I didn't know if I would be using it a lot. So typically for that, I just use like the Logitech camera that I have pops up on my computer. Um, but I mean, that's definitely a good idea. The main reason that I don't do that and kind of line in the G7 for even like the YouTube videos is because I change spots of the camera several times. So like I'll do my intro and outro where I'm facing, you know, the the back of my room and then all of my gears in the background and then for the actual session i set the camera up next to me so i can like look at it while i'm speaking yeah. and sometimes um depending on kind of where you know i put the the plugins or whatever in my DAW or what i'm talking about sometimes my wife will need to um turn off like my camera audio in the or my camera visual in the corner just to show my screen or sometimes she'll uh you know color grade that differently or do different kind of things so it's nice to have all the different layers separately so she can piece those together kind of how she needs so i really just figured out what works for her and then now i just do that (laughs) so rock stars um just just kind of riffing and brainstorming on why you might care about how to make videos for your own studio uh one thing to consider is if you're thinking about that sort of thing a first question you want to ask yourself is, who am I trying to reach? So like, who's this video for? So, you know, obviously this podcast, um, Austin's channel are reaching uh, other producers and studio owners like yourselves and, and, and with the intent of teaching more about recording. But you don't have to assume that that's what kind of content you would want to make for your studio. You may actually want to make content that is really um, meant for your audience of bands that are getting ready to hit the studio themselves. Maybe maybe it just helps them understand a little bit more about the recording process. And maybe you're teaching them all the stuff that you wish they knew more about when they came in to work with you in the studio. But I like, um, Austin, your tip about m- remembering to frame your shot. And this, we're just getting into the video world. The things that are in the background of your shot are one of those first lessons you learn when you're doing video where you're like, oh man, I didn't know I had like, you know, all my, all my snot rags and, you know, used tissues right behind me while I was shooting that video. You know, it's smart to have uh, where the background of the video is, you can see your studio. So Rockstars, you're making YouTube videos and you want, you know, bands and clients to come into your studio and work with you. Well, maybe you want them to see your studio so they see what, what a cool place it is. So that's a great tip. Yeah. And like my wife and I were literally talking yesterday at lunch about this. And I was like, I don't ever want to be an artist, But if I did, the first thing I would do is every time I go to the studio or every time I have like a band practice or a writing session, do some sort of like vlog or studio diary or something like that. Because when you can show fans and you can show other artists kind of your process, not only is it entertaining, like you can make it funny, you can make it fun. Um, People love seeing the process. They're just genuinely intrigued by it. But it also builds credibility, you know, in an age where we do have a lot of co-writes and a lot of producers and and ghostwriting and stuff like that. If somebody can watch you in the studio making your song, they, they understand a little bit better and they respect that. So like we see uh, an artist, John Bellion, 
who does it with a lot of his releases. And he's really, really known for that. Super highly respected throughout the production and the pop community, just in terms of a writer and a producer and just somebody who is a storyteller. And I think that having visuals for a lot of those things, it can be super low budget. I mean, you can do it on your iPhone with, you know, a $20 lav mic into your iPhone. That's really all it takes and free software. Like I have all of the Adobe suite for, I think like 20 bucks a month or something like that. And so like the content basically pays for itself. And it just allows people to kind of have one more step of communication. So like if I was an artist, I would absolutely be recording everything just because like some people might find it entertaining. Some people might, um, you know, be intrigued by it. You could even do video shows where like you, you know, stream live, right? Like I could pop up a webcam and a microphone and I could do a live acoustic performance for, you know, 20 of my friends on some kind of like discord server or something like that, where you still have like these really, really intimate interactions from a distance. And I think that that content allows you to do those things as a producer or a writer or an artist or somebody with a business. Like you could own a coffee shop and do these same exact things, you know, mm-hmm. show somebody how to make the best cup of coffee. And then I promise you, you're going to get more people in the next day. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, don't be discouraged by all these tools we're talking about. I mean, cause like, you know, like a Panasonic Lumix G7 camera, that's a, that's an investment, you know, mm-hmm. so that you don't need to start there. Um, you don't even need to start with an external mic on your iPhone. You could literally just take your cell phone, uh, you know, shoot a video where maybe you're setting up for a session and you've got an artist coming in and you may not be able to create videos that give, uh, you know, a look into that artist world because that, that that's their business. They may want to do that themselves. And, you know, you can't assume that an artist wants you to show them hitting the wrong notes before you tune them or something like that during a session. But you could show, um, I'm getting ready to do this session. And you walk around and show like how you're setting up a mic for a vocal and something else. And that kind of stuff is interesting. And I mean, you know, I, I think about the places where that stuff belongs and we have so many options now. It's like, does that go on your Instagram? Does it go on your Facebook? Does it go on your YouTube? And you might consider the, the again, who are you trying to reach? Well, if a band's considering working with you, then that means they haven't necessarily been following you yet. And maybe they're Googling to find out a little bit more about you. So what's going to pop up, you know? I, exactly. I, I suggest a YouTube video is more likely to pop up as an example of something that you find. And so therefore you might want to consider making little videos about your studio and about what you do and just putting them on YouTube with some regularity. And maybe that makes it easy for people to find your work. Yeah. And even on the other side of that too, I think try everything, right? So like, uh, Facebook was, was our bread and butter for years. And then we had the YouTube channel and it was very passive and we'd like built up 10,000 subscribers, which is definitely no small feat, but within the past, I don't know, two or three months, we've gotten up to 32,000 now just because nice. we had a couple of videos that do really well. And so now YouTube is a primary form of content for us. It wasn't before. And now it is when you find something that works, you really have to kind of double down on that. So like, um, I'm sure, you know, I have a really good friend, Mark Eckert, right. Who runs almost all of his mm-hmm. business through Instagram. I hardly ever well, I do now because of the YouTube videos and now we get Instagram followers from it. But before then I'd never booked a client through Instagram and Mark books most of his through Instagram. Meanwhile, I book most of mine through Facebook. So like find whatever content you like making and find whatever platform receives that best and then just nail it. Like I was on Instagram the other day and it's a lot easier now because now they have like pages you might like, or, um, you can like follow hashtags and stuff like that. So you can really expand the the people that you're following and, and the people that you're paying attention to, which is nice because it's a lot easier to reach others. But there was a guy who basically did like one to two minute Instagram videos on every band that came in where the band talks about like their vision coming into the studio. They Smart. do like a couple little B-roll shots of like them performing with basically the band talking about their experience and the producer talking about his experience. And it just kind of shows you like, hey, we came with an acoustic guitar demo and then we built it out. And now we've got a full band and we came in wanting to sound, you know, like... I don't know, like whoever. And then he did that and he did this and we tried these things and it worked and these didn't. And I mean, it's like a two minute peek into what they're doing. But for one, now that band feels hella special because you just put them on your Instagram and that's free promotion for them. Now you look legit because you've got people bragging about you and it's content to you that you can passively put in front of in front of people's face besides running an ad where it's like, hey, half off your studio time, you know, right down the street. These are all things that are super simple that you can do and you can keep them organic and genuine, but also reap the benefits of something that people have paid years and years for advertising 
for advertisements yeah. to do, then now you don't have to. Yeah, We've great. never spent a single dollar on make pop music advertisements or on my own advertisements ever. Wow, man. That's a good insight. Yeah. Um, well, it's just a good reminder, you know, like when you, when you think about creating these things, like I'm su suggesting, who are you talking to? And then, you know, how are you helping the people who are paying attention? How are you helping the people that you're asking to be in your video with you? So that's good insight. All right, well, let, let's jump to our closeout questions here and we'll see if we can Sweet. blast through these pretty quick. Um, when you started out in recording, what was holding you back? Um, I think just my preconceived notions of what, what the music industry was like. I think that I was, I was a kid who thought that they knew how it was because I heard how my parents and everybody talked about it and I didn't realize that it was nothing like that. Nice. And, um, and how'd you get past it? Honestly, just kind of chit chatting with people and, um, lots of trial and error, you know, it took years to figure out that maybe I don't want to move to LA and have a pub deal where I have an advance and I never play songs. It took years to figure that out. And I mean, it changed my whole goal, but you have to be kind of open and receptive to the change. So once I figured out, Hey, I can dominate kind of the independent market, help people that need help, help myself. It's, it's a win-win. You know, and for me, um, you know, when I thought about a pub deal, I just thought it meant you get free, free beer somewhere. Oh my God, I would have joined. <laughs> All right. So what was some of the best advice you received? Um, I think probably just to question everything and just, just be a little bit cynical. So it's really important to have an open mind when you're talking to people and communicating with people. But online, it's really easy for people to pretend um, that they have things that they, they don't have. So it took years of um, just being a little bit jaded of, of people being like, yeah, if you send me that song, I can get that in the hands of, you know, this a and or this manager and this manager. And finally I was like, no, no, you're not. And so, um, being able to kind of put up my boundaries when I need them, but still be open and receptive when genuine collaborations come in, I think was huge. That's great, man. Um, all right. So how about sharing a recording tip hack or secret sauce, something the rock stars could use today on their next session? Oh, for sure. I actually had this one in mind, uh, the other day, and that is to, Basically, when you have any downtime where you don't have people recording or you don't have anything booked or even just, you know, maybe after your sessions, if you download a new plugin, if you get new samples or whatever, spend some time not while you're in sessions developing new tools and figuring out how to use your plugins and figuring out which samples you like out of the pack you just bought. Because if you take, you know, an hour every week or so to kind of develop those techniques and those tools where you're not necessarily on the clock on a project, you save so much time because then when you're in that project, you're not just fiddling around and screwing around for hours and you don't lose track. So I like to spend a little bit of time um, every week or at least every couple of weeks figuring out something new that I can try to include in my productions while I'm not working on something. I like that. So if you're going through a sample pack or you're going through presets, do you have a personal method for taking notes so that when you come back later, you can, you can remember which ones you like the best. Yeah. Sometimes what I'll do is if I have samples that I really, really like, I'll just copy and paste those into a folder called like favorites or something like that. All of my samples are organized by pack and then within the pack, just by like kick snare, yada, yada, yada. So, I mean, they're pretty organized. And by this point, I typically know what I go for, but like when I get something new, if I find a sample that just like absolutely wows me, it goes into a favorites category. Other than that, I just kind of pay attention to even general packs. Like if I download something from splice, it's really simple now to go on there and just search. Like I need a snare that's this, this, and this, this, and this, and, um, having all of the organizational methods, prevent me from a lot of time of just, you know, going through and just dragging everything in and listening to 45 kick drums. I can just right. pick one. Cubase now too, they, they have a, a file previewer. So like I can open it up and it's got all the files on my hard drive and I can just click each one and it just plays it immediately. And if I want to, I just drag it into my DAW. So that, that saves a ton of time. Uh, that's cool, man. All right. So how about sharing, um, either a favorite hardware tool or something you're excited about that's physical. You're just always glad you got it on a session. Yeah. So, I mean, my monitors are probably like my most used thing. Um, even because like, I love my Apollo, don't get me wrong, but I could definitely work with like a Scarlet. Um, I love my M audio MIDI keyboard, but like I could easily work with a $15 MIDI keyboard from Amazon. Um, I would say my, my Focals are, are probably like my one piece of gear out outboard that I love. And then I've really, really been into the Loudon audio mics lately. They released like a new black series that they sent me to check out and, um, they're not like paying me to talk about them or anything. They just sent them to me to try. And honestly, I was blown away with like the $250 mic and the $500 mic because they sound incredible. Like I'm going to those more than I'm going to my slate VMS at the moment. So, um, Very I would say cool. my, my mics and my speakers. Um, and which Focal speakers do you use? The uh, shape 65s. Shape 65s. All right. Take it. Yep. All right, cool. Well, that was a great answer. Um, now, how Thank about you. same question for software tool? 
Um, I mean, obviously my DAW because everything's got to be in there. Um, so I would say Cubase 10 Pro. And then with Cubase 10 Pro, I would say probably Serum is my number one used synth because I'm just so familiar with it and I can make almost any sound. Other than that, I've been really into Anna 2 by Sonic Academy lately. Um, so those are probably like my VST instruments that I love the most. And then I love the slate bundle just for anything, um, mixing related. Like it's just so simple to use and it's super cheap to have. So I would say slate bundle and then mm-hmm. serum or Anna too. And okay, then my cool. doll. And I know you mentioned massive before, and I remember every time I would ever explore electronic music or trying to get great, great bass stuff, somehow massive always seemed to pop up on the radar. Massive is literally just an older version of Serum. They both work almost the same exact way. So I typically just go for a Serum because the graphic interface is a lot more visual. You can see all the waveforms. You can see the oscillators. So like if you picture a sound in your head sweeping up and swe- sweeping down, you see that on the actual VST. And Massive is not like that. So typically I just go for Serum. Um, sometimes okay, cool. though, if I want to just try something new, I'll go to Massive just because it forces me to step outside of my box a little bit. Nice. Well, I didn't know that about Serum, so that's cool. There you go. Yeah, There's I love, the oh my God, I love it. Yeah, yeah, I love it so much. <laughs> All right. How about sharing with the rock stores a resource or a tip for the business side of doing this? If they want to do music production and a studio for more than just a hobby. Yeah. So I think it's just all about having efficiency on the business side of things because we want to spend as much time actually creating. So just kind of automating those systems. Like I use Calendly to set up all of my appointments and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Those all come in through Calendly. Um, And then other than that, uh, just having some kind of like form to fill out for clients that are interested in working with you. So you can start vetting out the people that you want to work with, the ones that you probably don't want to spend a ton of time on. And then um, they just allow you to kind of figure it out so you can hit them up with a call. That way, by the time you're reaching out to them, you know what they want, what services they need, what budget they have, what their deadline is, who they even are. Um, That form to me was a game changer. That took my closing rate from like 50% on Facebook to like 95% on my website. And what, which was the last tool there? Um, it's just a form that I use through Wix. So like it's just oh, okay. built in. If you don't have Wix, you can use, uh, I believe Wufu is free and they have a form that you can use it. It's literally just like you set up whatever questions you want. So mine's like, what's your name? Uh, what services do you need? What budgets have you allocated for this project? Tell me a little bit about yourself. Where can I find you on the internet? So I can actually check them out. And then, uh, when do you need the project done by? And then just their email and their phone number so I can reach great, back out to them. Great yep. tip, man. All right. So, um, then uh, an organizational online resource, something um, or a technique in your studio that would help the rock stars keep their shit together. Yeah. So all of my file transfers and stuff like that go through Dropbox just because to me, that's the easiest. And you can put the Dropbox plugin on your computer so I can just save them to that and never have to worry about it. Mm. Um, Other than that, definitely just backing stuff up onto external drives like once a week. So um, I just did a computer tour today that's going to come out Thursday. And I, I talk a lot about on it. I only have one hard drive inside my desktop. I just have a one terabyte SSD that hosts all of my programs, all of my Cubase projects and all of my samples and like my sound libraries and stuff like that. Those are all on external drives. So if I need to pop over to a studio, all I have to do is take my iLock, my licensor, and then my two hard drives. And as long as they have Cubase in the same plugins, I'm, I'm good to go. So I would say cool. doing that. Cool. Yep. Take it, man. Um, with those external hard drives, can they just be USB a lot of the times? Do they have to be some kind of like hotshot Thunderbolt connection, anything like oh, that? Oh, mine are just USB. No, I just have a one terabyte SSD US, uh, USB hard drive and then a four terabyte HDD. So the SSD has my program or it has my sessions on it. And then mm-hmm. the HDD has all of like my samples. And that's where like I'll put the stems on. That's where I'll bounce down all of the files. So I kind of use the HDD how most people would use their main drive on like a typical computer. And then I use the SSD for my actual sessions. And then my hard drive on my computer is specifically just dedicated to my operating system. That way nothing's working too hard. Plus if my computer crashes, the hard, the external hard drives are probably going to be fine. So all I have to do is just go to a new computer, throw up the installers, and then I'm good to go. Yeah. Nice tip, man. All right. So, um, now, uh, we're going to do hypothetical question. You got somebody who's, you know, starting out, um, starting out fresh. They don't, they really, they're in a new place. They need to, uh, record with something they need to find people to record and they need to make ends meet so they can because their parents aren't paying for their bills anymore um what what advice would you have you know simple setup how would you find people um and how would you make ends meet to start out yeah so i would say number one before you get to that like make or break uh spot in your life i would say spend some time developing your your skill set spend some time developing artists like i would say work with some people 
you know, maybe just to develop them, not even to like make some money or whatever that'll develop clients in the long run. And then in terms of like developing just a simple setup and finding your clients, I would say that all you really need is a good pair of headphones, uh, probably just like an interface, um, a laptop, and then like a $15 MIDI keyboard from, from, uh, Amazon, Amazon or something, or something like that. Yeah. You don't even need like a good one. And then for clients, I mean, like if, if somebody told me today, like, Hey, you have to move to Fiji tomorrow. I'd be fine. None of my clients are in Orlando. Um, actually one is, but I mean, it, he's a good friend. So other but than that, he knows somebody in Fiji. So you're all set. There, there you go. <laughs> so, so that's kind of why I've positioned my whole business and stuff like that to be online. Because like when I started producing, I was so young, my wife was in school. So I was like, when she graduates, I want to be able to go wherever her job takes her. And then, you know, who knows where we'll want to move to one day, settle down. Maybe we'll have kids one day. Maybe we'll vacation and travel a lot. I want to be able to like never feel like I'm, I'm not able to work. So of course I've got my room set up exactly how I want it in the apartment I'm in now. But if I got a call that said, Hey, we need you in LA tomorrow, I can just pack up my interface, my headphones, and then my external hard drives and I'm good to go. And all of my clients are online. So nothing, they're never going to know the difference. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then when you started, you, I forgot where you said you were working, but you just you picked up a job somewhere that would kind of help you pay your bills, um, and then just focused on you know finding people to make music with before you were actually making music from from your studio, right? Yeah, 100%. So I mean, I was like I said, for years, I was just working on my own stuff, just because I was like obsessed with the creation process. Then I was working at Barnes and Noble. And that's where I decided that like, I want to get into production. Another guy started working there. He's now my best friend. His name's Grayson Gibson. So shout out to Grayson. He was telling me he wanted to like, just start. uh, He wanted to start like, being a pop artist, he was really interested in doing like acoustic kind of singer songwriter pop. And I was like, Hey, I guess I'm trying to learn pop production. So I just had him over one night. I'd been working on some pop stuff myself. We, you know, ordered a pizza and then recorded a song. And ever since then, we've been like best friends. He was a client for years. Um, and then that was like my first intro to pop. So like I kind of developed him and, you know, we did a bunch of songs together, got him on some playlists. He got quite a bit of, you know, streams and stuff like that. And then I was able to kind of leverage that into a portfolio for myself. Um, and just a little bit of, of authority. So when people hired me, they hired me because they wanted to hire me, not, but just not just because they needed somebody to do a job and they just stumbled upon me. That's cool, man. All right. So here comes the last hypothetical question. We're going to take the way back studio machine. You're going to go back in time, find young nine-year-old Austin. I don't know what kind of songs you were writing at nine years old, but, um, probably something like, you know, like, I'm waiting by the the rail the train tracks track nine from hundred. No, sorry, that's the kind of stuff I wrote when I was nine. Um, but you're gonna go back find young Austin. Say, yo, dude. I know I look older now, but uh, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself to one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Just be as genuine as possible because like with music, I've always done it just because I I genuinely loved it. I've been obsessed with it since I was a child. I grew up around it. So um, I would tell him to just make sure you always focus on the music and just the genuine connections that you can make with that. Don't ever get too focused on the money. Don't ever get too focused on any accolades. Don't ever get too focused on long term stuff. Like you can do all that with the business side of things, but in terms of making music, definitely just make music because you want to make it work with people you want to work with. Um, and then other than that, like actual practical advice, it's not just like, you know, the generic, I tell myself to be nice to people. Um, I would tell myself to probably learn theory cause I'm just now getting into that. And I wish I would have learned it younger just right. because it's, it's a lot to learn. You said you're taking piano lessons now. I am. Yeah. I'm taking uh, piano and theory lessons every Friday with, um, with my man, his name's Christopher C. He lives in Toronto. So we do them over Skype and he's incredible. He's like a, an orchestrator and composer and he's insane. So, um, he's actually been on our channel and, and done a couple videos. So if the name sounds familiar, maybe you all have seen him on the channel doing like chord theory breakdowns, but yeah, we're doing weekly lessons. And honestly, he's got me to the point to where like, I could barely tell you what keys were in C major. So now we're working with like different modes and we're doing, um, you know, different kind of jazz extensions. Like the other day we were doing two five ones with like half diminished extensions and all those kind of things. So like cool. it's literally only been a month and a half and we're already into all of that. And I've, I've become already such a more well-rounded writer and I'm just kind of understanding what I'm doing because I've always played by ear and it's always been fine. Like I've always had plenty of ideas and, and I was able to work with it, but it's nice to know what's going on under the hood. Yeah, definitely. I will. He may have a new student out of me at some point here too. So thanks for that tip. All right. 100. So uh, thank you again so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. I got no more questions for you, dude, except for 
How can the rock stars find you online? Where should they go to learn more about you, get in your Facebook group, all this stuff? Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much for having me, man. It's been a blast to just hang out. If you want to chat, um, of course, come join the group just because we're always looking for more people to kind of join the conversations in there. Um, And when you join, definitely make yourself known. Definitely post something about yourself. We love actually meeting the people as they join. Other than that, if you want to check out all of the videos um, and just kind of you know, content that, that we've kind of talked about throughout, just check out make pop music on, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Other than that, if you ever want to listen to my personal stuff, you can just go to austinhole.com. That's all my productions and mixes and stuff like that. And then if you ever want to chat, just feel free to, to message me on my personal page. I'm always on Facebook talking to people. If you ever want to reach out by, by email, it's just austin at austinhole.com. So I'm, I'm always around. I'm sure you'll find me. You'll probably find me floating around the, the recording studio rock stars group. So just nice, reach man. out and let's chat. Yeah, well, thank you, dude. Uh, do you have any questions for the rock stars before you part? I don't actually. No. Um, let me see. I can think of one real quick. All right. We're on YouTube as well, so it's a, a quick and easy place for people to leave comments, and then also in the blog post as well. Perfect. I would say to them, um, what is the one thing that they think is holding them back from their goals? So, like, no matter what their goal is, like, if if you just want to make a living producing, what's holding you back from that? If you want to you know, get a Grammy, what's holding you back from that? Because if you can assess those things that you think are the holdbacks, you can start to actually work towards those. Cause too many people just complain about what's not happening and without mm-hmm. actually assessing it. So I would say, ask yourself that. Um, and then just spend a little bit of time kind of meditating on those things. All right. Dig it. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm all for more meditation. Well, Austin, what an awesome time hanging out with you, dude. Um, your, uh, your, your high energy is infectious. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, it's it's fun to just kind of wind you up with a question and then just see where you go with it because you've got so much to share. So thank you for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. Absolute blast. Next time in, I'm in Orlando, I'll spend less time with the mouse and a little more time uh, having a coffee with you. Um, and, you know, just thanks for being around on and being on the podcast, man. Absolutely, man. Thank you one more time for having me. If you're ever in Orlando, uh, you've got a place to crash. You've got people to come hang with. So let oh, me know thanks. when you're rolling through. <laughs> all right. Wait, was that for all the rock stars listening or was that just for me? <laughs> so for all the rock stars, if you're in Orlando, we'll definitely grab a coffee. But for you specifically. <laughs> all right. Sounds good, man. Good, good distinction. All right. Hey, thanks, man. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person and seeing you around the studio. 100%, man. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. Also, remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with these weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free mixing course at mixmasterbundle.com. Look for the link in the show notes. And if you want more free content from Recording Studio Rockstars, all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email. Again, that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, podcast updates, and even free gear giveaways for your studio, all totally free. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw, and and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music.